Okay. Happy, happy. Now we'll look for botryoidal textured rocks, yes? Oh, can you say again, please? We're looking for your uh, uh, botryoidal textured rocks. Yeah, it looks like there might be a couple around here. Um, and we just have uh, uh, Beth here, so if, um, if there's anything that you see, it's actually oh, uh, off the screen, too. Raj. Yeah. If I um, colloquially accidentally call it the pancake batter rock, um, it's just because that's how I remember what that looks like. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> it's like when you fry in a pancake and the bubbles start coming through. Mm. Bacha yoidal. So you want us to kind of swing around and look around here for a texture before we start moving? Sure. Or do you want to hold off? I, I didn't quite catch what you said, Tim. Do you want to hold off? Okay. Okay. Thanks, that, that's helpful. We're, we're trying to be opportunistic, uh, just to be mindful of the conditions up here. So are we holding off on the sample? We're so gonna, yeah. yeah. Raj, Raj. All right, um, Nav, let's uh, go ahead and call in a ship move. Yeah, this is the best nodule field we've seen on this dive by far. Okay. We'll so make we the same move. Roger that, and can you give us an update on the weather outside? Okay, uh, weather remaining the same. Uh, wind blowing 22 knots, okay. which is kind of under control. Raj. <laughs> Next, uh, <laughs> we'll be moving towards uh, 325, three, three same as before. 325, three. Roger. Yep. Praise this is nav. Can we move this ship on bearing 325, 50 meters? Yes, please. Yeah, we've seen we've seen quite a bit of diversity so far up on the ridge. It's impressive. Yeah, it's been beautiful. Okay, I think as we move on toward waypoint three, um, we'll keep an eye out for another geological sample as we get uh, near that that location. Roger. Roger that. Another Colophagus. Like a Roger, Roger, Roger. She just passed on the right. Thank you. Good luck. Roger, 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 oh, Roger, 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 Roger. That looks like a nice sponge. Oh, there's yeah. stuff everywhere. Polyopagon. I want to go yeah. lateral under, like towards you, yeah? Yeah, you want a lateral to the right there. Roger, Roger. Val, you weren't joking about this field. It's quite big, quite extensive. Yeah. But you have time, though, so you don't have to book it. Okay. Ship start moving. Raj. And watch to your watch to your right there as you lateral. Got a coral. Um, nope. We've passed waypoint two, but not by far. It was like down here or something. Yeah, we <coughs> we came out across this uh, nodule field, so we've just been hanging out here. <laughs> But yeah, we're gonna start Raj, heading Raj, that Raj, way. Raj, 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 yeah. Raj, Raj, Raj. This is I hear point. you. I'm trying to change. <laughs> yeah. if, even if you just change your heading a little bit and then go yeah. forward. I don't like. Yeah, actually, you're going to want to lateral the other way, Kylie. You're going to lateral to the right, not to the left. Well, I was going to lateral to the left and then go straight because my heading has changed this much. And I was just going to, like, kind of zip out in front a little so that way I can see what I'm doing and not lateral into any corals. So if you lateral like, right now, you're going to no, be... No, now I'm going straight, like, like, just enough to get away from that coral so I could see it. And, like, now kind of go straight and then, like, adjust my head. Oh, see, now Adelina's bouncing around. Raj, Raj. Maybe we should go, yeah. And now change my heading and kind of, because now I'm kind of getting better better in front, right? Yeah, that's better, yeah. yeah. 
We had a question about... If you want to hold off on forward movement and just kind of stay... You can see that there's a bit of a shelf here, so it's coming up in my sonar. Okay. So you can kind of just play at that distance, but not don't go any further forward. We had a question about how corals in the deep sea time their reproduction since they can't go off the moon. Do we know any information about that? That is a very good question. That is a really good question. Um, huh. Temperature is fairly constant and everything, too. Why don't we ask our experts? Steve's targeting. Steve seems like he's on it. <laughs> And Ryan, <laughs> which Temple University's former or current grad student can answer first? Roger. Thank you. Okay, Kylie, so ship's going this way again, so mm -hmm. you're just going to want to lateral back. Okay. Just keep my heading. Yeah. Yeah, you can keep your heading, keep it Pretty into the slope, now. but we're going to be going to the left now. Gotcha. Okay. It seems that the ship is uh, drifted towards almost south. You want to pull up the weather? It's at the tab. I see. Okay. Okay. Or if we can go to manual and uh, at least uh, move forward. So to answer the question about uh, deep coral reproduction, um, they look for, uh, Ryan says they look for seasonal pulses of phytodetritus. So mm. things moving through the water, uh, tidal currents sometimes, both okay, of those are sometimes um and then some others do it uh non-cyclically we still drifted roger and then asako was mentioning that uh a lot of deep water coral are brooding <laughs> potentially so they can, they, they don't too. broadcast spawn where the gametes need to meet in the water um that all happens internally Do you come here? You might hit a you might hit a rock there in your port. <laughs> yeah, you can you can use your side cams. Yeah, you can always change your heading a little bit if you want to change it more towards like two seven zero, and then you can face into the slope as we kind of lateral and forward. Um, given the way that it's moving right now, it's easiest to lateral back, but. So you don't have good vis, you can turn, if you turn about 90 degrees to where you're at, then you can do a bit of lateral forward instead. We had a question about how many uh, members of our science team do we have on land and not on the ship? Yeah, something like that. Looks good. I think we have uh, okay, somewhere start, close. Ship start moving uh, back to where it was. Yeah, so now you using manual, but again the speed will be almost a bit high. 
Yes, bridge. I think we have somewhere on the order of around 50 people um, participating in the uh, uh, Yes, if we team. can later on, uh, once you satisfy, uh, back to DB and then uh, proceed towards uh, bearing uh, 325. So we have a pretty large offshore team, but some of the folks in the offshore um, communications are also folks aboard here. Okay, so. team. We only have three minutes left. Um. Diane's going to run down. We are figuring some logistics out for the moment. We'll have an update for you shortly.
All right, so we're assessing a couple of conditions up here at the surface uh, and uh, just kind of hang, hang in there for a few minutes. We're uh, making some decisions.
Check, check, one, two, check, check, one, two. Front row, this is Beth in the back row. Oh, I don't think you can hear me. Hey, front row. Sorry, this is Beth in the back row. I don't think you guys are on SPL. Can That's correct. Yeah, we're just uh, just give us probably two more minutes and okay. we'll get on SPL. Great. Thanks. thanks. Hello, back row. Hello, front row. Hey, so question for you folks. Yeah. Um, there's been, we're right on the weather window. Yeah. Right on the margin. So the question for you is, would you like to try to take a sample right here, right now, and where we're more confident that we can do it? Or would you like to try progressing the ship with the chance of not being able to get a sample later? Um, I think we have done some recent sampling. Okay. And so uh, I would like to try to see if we can keep moving and see what we see. Okay, roger that. Um, and if we're holding for just a moment, we can also do some close-ups of some of these, uh, what I think are Chrysogorgia in our, our front view here. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I will make that so. Okay, well, when the bridge is ready, let's do a ship move towards yonder waypoint. Trevor, Diane here. Hello, Diane. Very quiet, Diane. Uh, sorry, uh, I'll speak up, but I'd like to uh, for us to remember to pop a Niskin bottle about 10 meters off the bottom when we're leaving the dive. Yep. That's her background eDNA. 10 meters off bottom. Okay, great. Thank you. Please remind me if I don't remember on my own. But Roger. yes, understood. Okay.
So to our audience watching from all over the world, welcome. We're in the middle of a shift change and everybody getting resettled. And uh, also trying to understand what is happening with the ship at the surface and its ability to hold station, uh, which will affect our dive. Uh, as always, feel free to send us any comments or questions uh, via the Nautilus Live webpage. Three, two, five, Roger. Thank you. Okay, where am I? Where are you? Oh, over here. All right. Let's get set up for normalness, and then we can do some imagery of some beautiful animals. Beautiful animals. Steve, I don't think you and I have been on watch in a while. It's been a while, Trevor. Yeah. I'm excited to do this again. I like working with you. Let's make some pretty pictures. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of pretty pictures. Oh, I can't come down there. Video, it's do you mind changing the satellite feed things. two to oh, um, the sonar view? Roger. Let me just get that dialed up. One moment. So for anyone that's been joining us recently, we are currently diving on King George Seamount in the Papahanamua Kuakea Marine National Monument. This is our first dive of this expedition. Ashen, come down on Delta, please. Maybe uh, 12 right now. This dive has been focusing on a ridge feature yeah, on you. the southeastern end of the King George Seamount. And we've been slowly working our way up the seamount. Looks like we have a dead, dead uh, okay. sponge stalk in the oh, view, oh, main man. view here. And uh, some small manganese nodules over some sediment, uh, as well as what Ship looks, looks like, like it's some actually doing something. That's great. Uh, That's awesome. Everything's working. Tell us as it's expected. come down slope as we and move as up this ridge. Not a ton of animals, but we are seeing some. And we're seeing different types of corals and All sponges. All right, I'm gonna get over here, and we can image these guys. Yeah, so... Ashton, uh, could you give me a heading 325, please? We have many colleagues joining us from shore to help us with animal identifications, because not all of us are animal experts. But we are seeing some... And we'll get set up to zoom in on 12. some of these in just a moment. Okay, Steve, let's zoom in there, please. All right, what are we looking at here? Got my little cheat sheet in front of me. <laughs> very colorful. It is very colorful. I need my light. When everybody has a chance, we can maybe introduce everyone to the people who are watching on our, uh, our watch. So as with many deep sea, All right, thank you. Uh, now I gotta go the other way. Corals and sponges, they are often habitat for other Faster. organisms, so we've seen a couple associated organisms as well. I can start off the introductions if you want. This is Steve and the video chair. Hello, this is my first watch of the year. Awesome, Steve. I guess I'll go with myself because I'm already here. I'm Shelby Johnson. I'm a science communication fellow. This is also my first watch ever with AV Nautilus. Shelby, you might need to move your mic a little bit closer. Oh. A little quiet. Better? Yes. Awesome. Bethy, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, of course I do. Uh, I am 
uh, Beth Orcutt. I'm a senior research scientist at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences in Maine. And uh, this is also my first dive of the year. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be back. Fantastic. Annabelle, do you want to go ahead? Hi, uh, I'm Annabelle. I am an undergraduate student studying microbiology, and this is my first time on the Nautilus and my first watch. Ooh, first timers all around. Woo woo. <laughs> Anybody in the front row want to introduce themselves if they have a second? Yeah, I do. I'm awesome. Trevor. I'm a Herc pilot. Uh, this is my uh, first time in the van today. <laughs> <laughs> Diane, do you want to introduce yourself? I'd be happy to. This is Diane, and I'm a science manager in training. This is also my very first shift in the chair. So I will be data logging for you guys. Thank you. Hoi, Paul, would you like to introduce yourself? Mm. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Hoi Paul Berdeman, and I am here as a cultural liaison, and this is also my first time in the lab. Welcome. Welcome. All right, it looks like our other two folks up front are maybe still a little busy with their handover. Yeah, if you give them a second to get settled in. Shelby, where do we have people tuning in from? Do you know? I sure can find out. All over, we have Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Germany. Let's zoom in on this thing, Steve. Hong Kong, oh, we got a moment. everywhere. Love it. Yeah, so it looks like we've got a bottle brush, Chrysogorgia. I'm going to take a guess <laughs> until someone corrects me. Full zoom. Oh, yeah, look at all those beautiful polyps out. All right, thanks. Yeah, thanks, video. Actually, I should ask, Stephen, do you prefer to be called video or Stephen? Oh, uh, I, I don't know. I like my name, I guess. Okay. Steve, Steve, Steve Video. Yeah, whatever works. Okay. I'll respond uh, to both. Okay. And no offense taken, either way. Nav, when you have a moment, can I ask you some questions? Hi. Yeah. It can either be on SPL or directly, whatever you prefer. Sure. OK. Um, can you um, tell me a little bit about uh, what we are doing in terms of our movement? Yeah. So currently, um, we had been uh, diving on our first waypoint and collecting some samples. Um, we're all finished up there, so we're heading um, up to the north to our next waypoint. Okay. Um, to dive there and see what we can see. All right. Yeah, so for folks at home, we've got some not insignificant weather happening up here at the surface that is affecting how we are able to operate here on the bottom with our ROVs in the water. And uh, so we've been following this ridge feature, getting back on course to head up to our waypoint at the next depth. And uh, what you can see in, if you have the quad view on at home, in the bottom left corner of the satellite feed, you can see the um, 
sonar view that we're seeing from the two ROVs to tell us kind of where that ridge feature is <laughs> in relation to our vehicles. Sometimes animal density is different on one side of a ridge than another. Um, so that's something we'll be looking for as we're moving up. And the reason for that is how the currents move around this ridge. And currents bring food for all these filter feeding animals. So where there's more current, there's often more animals. So this part of the ridge looks like it had a, a sheet flow of lava come down, relatively thin, which maybe the rocks are a little bit more stable than what we were seeing when we first started the shift. So there's a few more animals. Seems that different type of Chrysogorgia coral are the uh, dominant big organism in this area. Yeah, there's lots of, it looks like lots of little barnacles on these rocks. It looks like we have someone wondering if they can get an explanation of what channel one and channel two are and if they're the same and if they're both coming from Hercules. Thanks for the question. Uh, so if you have the quad view on at home, satellite feed one or channel one is the view from the uh, one of the cameras on Herc uh, looking forward as we're moving. The view in channel two is, I believe, coming from a downward looking camera on Herc, uh, looking down over the basket. Um, uh, so neither of these views are coming from the uh, second ROV above Hercules, ROV Adelana. Um, oh, that's beautiful. Now we've changed one of the views here in the room and uh, Stephen, if we could get the Atalanta view maybe on channel two, although I know that we've had some issues with it glitching in and out, so it might be hard to watch. But <laughs> yeah, you wanted something different up there? Uh, channel two, if you could put on um, the Atalanta camera. Um, no? Okay, never mind. Okay, so we're good with what we got. Yep. Um, we can, though, maybe change channel three to the high pack view so that our folks at home can see our movement up the ridge. Thanks, Stephen.
Hey, back row, if we want to do a sample, we should do it right now. You see anything? Uh, okay. <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, right. No so a lot of these animals uh, we uh, pretty much know, so we don't necessarily need them for specimen identification. Um, and it, I'm thinking some of these rocks are going to be hard to pick up, but we can try. Okay. Um, I'm thinking that right over here, I don't know if you can see the telestrator, yep. Trevor, over in that area might have the best luck. Okay. This is going in the front of the side? Um, I think it, uh, probably the side. Okay, side, Roger. Um, okay. Um, can you Diane, show me the craft, please? Can you tell me the status of the bio boxes? Are they both full? Nope, a craft arm, yeah. Are both the bio boxes full? Forward bio boxes. So, do you have a specific one in mind there, Beth? Um, uh, da -da 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 -da. I wonder if this is loose. Uh, s yes, Probably. porch light, please. Sorry, stand by, Beth. Yeah, okay, that helps. Thank you. Um, Val, do you have... Okay, one more time. Well, could you telestrate me? Yeah, one second, Trevor. I'm waiting for some guidance from Val from back here. Okay. Does I know this one has an animal on it, but do you think that... Okay. Yeah. Doesn't mean we can't collect it. It just means we're collecting two things at once. It's a big rock. The one with the coral on it? Yeah. Okay, so we won't do that. Big, big rock. Um... Val, what about this? That's probably also too big. No, th this this is fine. This one? Let's see if it's free. Yep. Okay, let's try to pick that up. Okay, try. Well, one does not try. <laughs> <laughs> there is no try. I think Dan let's definitely pick that up. Okay, zoom in please, Steve. Yeah, hold position please. Yeah, there's some chunky bits in there that might be good for the dating part. Okay, great. Come wide, please. Thank you, Trevor. Can you put craft preset on there? Okay, can you show Ashton how to open the starboard bio box? And Science Row, yes. stand by on opening it. Um, Science Row, is there going to be floaty stuff in the starboard bio box? There is a C... Uh, C star in the starboard bio box. Do you know which container? A? We can't hear you. We can't hear you, Diane. Stand by on opening the box, please. Close the box. That should be easier. Science or row. F. Can you tell me which row the or which one the floaty thing is? One. That moment. is in A. Okay, the C star is in A, Trevor. Thank you. Can yep. this one go in e Echo or Foxtrot? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, you can open the box. Keep going open and stop there. I'm going to put it in Foxtrot. So for our viewers at home, channel three is showing you the collection of the sample into the Foxtrot. That's Foxtrot, Foxtrot taken. Box. Why is this? What made that sample so important? Yeah. Like what made it look good enough to actually I'll collect? I'll tell you that in just a second. Yeah, box in please. Thank you. Um, Trevor, are we going to be picking up off bottom? Yeah, right now. Okay. Uh, we want to fire a Niskin at 20, uh, 10 meters. Oh, uh, I don't know that we're recovering necessarily right now. We're just coming off the bottom. I see. Okay. Do you want a Niskin on this sample? No, thank you. Okay. I misinterpreted what was happening here. Raj. Uh, okay, cool. We are good to come off here. Okay, yeah. So the rock now. sample we just picked up, we're hoping has uh, some original signature of the rock uh, from when it formed on the seamount. And instead of being really highly altered, which might remove some of the signal that the geochemists and the geologists need to record that signature. And so we are looking for rocks that kind of have more of an angular look instead of uh, rounded and looking like they're really, really crusty. And so um, when we were looking in the video and kind of turning it around, we could see that there were some chunky angular parts good bits. <laughs> so hopefully that'll be a good sample for that purpose awesome 
um, the rock will still be a value, even yeah, if do it, it yeah, doesn't totally. help for that particular analysis. Um, so we have another many geologists and geochemists that are interested in these samples. And so even if it is highly altered, that information is also interesting in terms of what has happened to the rocks on the seamount, um, what kind of mineral contents do they have. Mm. Mute. Are they, what are they doing right now? Uh, if they're able to hold, then we can move, but you can double check. So lots, uh, quite a significant coral density here. One of the highest I've seen on the dive so far. Trevor, what's our maneuverability right now? It's low, Okay. but non-zero. We're okay. just sorting that out now. Yeah. Yep, three one zero. Thank you. Nav, can I have you drop a waypoint for that recent sample as NA one three eight dash zero one? Thanks for that, zero. Trevor. Okay. So for folks at home, uh, if you happen to be watching the quad view or looking at channel three, you might be wondering, what am I looking at here? This is our view of where our vehicles are in relation to one another and on top of the seamount. So the green color underneath is a reflection of the seafloor. Uh, and so those black lines uh, that look like contour lines are telling us kind of the direction of the slope and things like that. The big red uh, shape is an indication of the ship. Uh, and then we have below that the locations, relative locations of ROV Hercules and ROV Atalanta. Uh, I'm actually not sure if Atalanta is shown here. It might just be Hercules. Um, so the red is indicating where Hercules is in relation to the ship as we're moving up this slope. Wow, beautiful. So several different types of coral in front of us here. We've got some, I think, hemichorialid and chrysogorgia. And please take that, all of what I just said with a grain of salt, because I'm not <laughs> an animal biologist. I'm just trying to remember what I learned last time. Thanks for that, Beth. <laughs> Someone's wondering how old the ridge is, but isn't that one of our sort of objectives to sort of see, pinpoint exactly how old the ridge is or how old the seamount is? Correct, Shelby. So um, for those in our audience who might know the history of the Hawaiian Island and the Northwest Hawaiian Island chain, uh, we know that those, uh, the seamounts of the Hawaiian Islands and the Hawaiian Island chain go from youngest in the east to oldest in the west. Um, maybe up to about 40 million years or so along that trajectory. Mm -hmm. The seamounts that we are diving on, on this expedition series, are a little oblique and off-center from that axis of North Hawaiian Islands to Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And so it's unclear how old these seamounts are. They may be in that same age range, or they may be actually quite a bit older. older. There's some yeah. um, other seamounts in the region um, that have been dated a bit older. And one uh, dredge sample collected a long time ago, mm -hmm. uh, many decades ago, when we didn't have really sophisticated uh, da dating techniques um, that also maybe suggest that this is older. So that's a main objective of this cruise, is to collect rock samples that will help us date. It's 
vulture. Front row, do you have a minute for a question? Is it a video question? It's a question from online. People are just wondering about the weather since we've been mentioning it a lot and how it sort of affects manipulating the ROVs, if at all. Yeah, the weather doesn't so much affect the ROVs that are on the seafloor, but uh, they are tethered to the ship. So this is true. if the ship, you know, if the wind is too strong or the current is too strong, the ship can't hold position, that makes it difficult for us to go where we want with the ROVs. Uh, this is Beth jumping back in after answering some other questions. Um, Shelby, coming back to your earlier question about the age. Yes. Um, I'm thankful for some of our scientists ashore <laughs> who are giving us some uh, more up-to-date information. Um, so clarifying that the age of um, the dredge sample uh, that exists so far is about 75 million years old, so quite a bit older than the Hawaiian Island, mm -hmm. uh, Northwest Hawaiian Island chain. Um, but again, that's a one sample. Exactly. So we need to get a couple more. Exactly. We might be surprised. Looks like we have some kind of stocked sponge off to our left-hand side of the camera. Just went out of frame. Hello, back row. Yeah, I'm listening. We're, we're going to leave bottom momentarily. Yeah. Uh, we have a, probably 160 minutes to surface, and we want to be on deck by 7. Okay. So that is about now. Uh, yeah. You wanted to do a 10-meter off bottom Niskin, is that right? Correct. Okay, ADNA, great. please. And any other thing you want to do before we, we don't have a lot of maneuverability? Yeah. No, um, that's all we need to do. All we need to do. Roger that. Which color should that be called? Trevor, that's going to be Niskin 2. Niskin 2. Roger that. Set you up there, Kylie. Yeah. yeah, so for our global audience watching from home, uh, we've got quite some strong winds and weather that, that we're contending with up here at the surface, so we're going to be ending Sorry, this dive yeah, a little bit yeah, early um, so that we can recover Ooh, under safe yeah, conditions. Look at the, let's not get too excited now. <laughs> uh, let me know when you got comms, I'll give you a valve. Uh, valve, camera's correct, so you're going for two. I'm racked in. 
And we are 7.3 meters off bottom, so once you get lined up, we'll, uh, could you come up on your delta, please? Steven, once you get lined can you up, change we'll channel two? To altitude. Oh, actually, you already got it. Never mind. You're so quick. Two looks like it's the yellow one. So for our audience at home, uh, in channel three, you're seeing a view of our Niskin bottles. These go down open. And then when we pull uh, on negative. one of these cords, go up lanyards, a little higher. it you can get close, but we're not allows ready. the top and bottom to close. So keep your eye on the back I left. Am coming up nice and slow. And as they pull the and lanyard Ashton, you can keep a 15 meter delta. You'll see one of those tops close. The purpose of the eDNA project is to see if this can be a useful tool for identifying biodiversity in the deep sea. Um, this sample we're collecting right now is a little bit of a background sample as we're away from where the animals are um, to see what okay, kind of signature that has. Okay, that's good. You can go do a Niskin now. Bench is not a very easy seat for that job. Nice one. Niskin triggered. You're good. Yeah, Niskin has Okay, that's 10.0 meters, too. Wow. All right. Wow. Okay, you Perfect. got the location there, Annette? Great. Anything else you want us to do before we're off bottom, or can we set up for recovery now? You can go ahead and set up for recovery, Trevor. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to do. What was that sample number, Diane? That is 011. All right. So even though it was a relatively short dive, we still managed to get 11 samples. Very, very good. Roger. A couple of folks were also wondering why we switched to Atalanta and are not using Argus to sort of hover over Hercules. Yeah, that decision was made early on in nope, the expedition because well, there were some thruster issues the, with this thing uh, Argus that need to be resolved. And so luckily we travel with backups. Exactly. So we have backups are always important. We actually have four ROVs on the ship. Um, and so thankfully, we could swap out uh, Atalanta for Argus. We're going to call this off bottom. OK. So for our audience at home, um, we expect to begin recovering. Uh, so we'll be transiting through about, oh, what, what is our depth? I think we're 2,400 meters. Uh, so it'll take us a little while to get up to the surface. Uh, we should be recovering on deck in about a little over two hours, mm -hmm. our time, which is always an exciting uh, thing to watch <laughs> in the satellite <laughs> feed. Uh, channel 3, you can see <laughs> what the weather is uh, from the point of view of the monkey deck. Um, I've got some waves picking up, some white crests, white cap. It looks so much more intense with the camera. I feel like when I'm out there, it didn't look that bad. <laughs> right. Well, now then you feel like, oh, yeah, we yeah, are actually we're, moving. We're right? actually moving. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in terms of, sorry, hold on one second. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks, Oliva. Uh, in the camera view that we're sending off uh, the ship, so in channel three, the bottom left-hand corner, 
now that we can see outside from in here, like we can see that we're moving, <laughs> even though, yeah, exactly. Someone's wondering if we have a backup for Hercules, and we do, called Little Herc, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. <laughs> so still capable, but a little smaller. Do you know if there's any major differences between uh, Main Herc and Little Herc? So Little Herc is quite a bit smaller than uh, Hercules that we're using right now. It has less sampling capabilities. Of course. Um, more for looking right. at what's <laughs> going on on the seafloor. Um, still a very capable ROV, just mm -hmm. not uh, as adept at sampling. It doesn't have as much capacity for sampling. Is it, d does it have any sampling ca uh, capabilities? I don't know the answer to that, so I, I'm I don't believe it, I don't believe it does. Yeah. It's more of a, a seeing eye. Yeah. Yeah. It can collect accidental samples. Yeah. <laughs> Voluntary samples. Yeah, voluntary samples, that's right. Oh, this is a good one. Someone's wondering if the light ever affects or damages any of the plants or the animals that we collect. So if um, all of you were Roger. watching, um, you saw that we picked Roger. up a beautiful uh, sea star not too long ago. So um, in an instant like that, um, would the light affect um, any animals or plants being picked up? The answer to that's a little unclear, actually. So there are many deep sea species that have modified eyes, um, right? Because down here in the bottom of the ocean, right. there's not a lot of no light. No visibility, right. Um, well, there's plenty of visibility, but there's just not a lot of light, mm. uh, except for bioluminescence. That's true. Um, and then perhaps kind of infrared light when you're around an area that has um, thermal uh, hydrothermal seepage. And... Whether or not or how sensitive those modified eyes are to light is actually not well known. Um, and part of that may be because of how we traditionally sample. So there have been a few studies that have done work where they just use red light mm -hmm. to see. It's much more difficult. you got to go a lot slower um, because we humans can't see. Right. Um, but there's some indication that the, the animals actually might be somewhat sensitive. Some of them, not all of them. Right. So a sea star doesn't Probably have not. modified <laughs> uh, eyes. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe for some of the fishes and other species, it's unclear. We are definitely the brightest thing they have ever seen. I was thinking the same thing. And it's also not clear if it might just be like, what is that, owl? But then there's no long-term damage. Right. It may very well be the brightest light they ever see ever in their whole lives. Yeah, we are the aliens they've been waiting for. So we're not going to the top of this seamount, correct? We're not. No, we were actually never planning to right. go all the way to the top. Mm -hmm. um, our dive focus was actually towards the deeper parts of the ridge of the seamount um, because we wanted to focus on getting some rock samples mm -hmm. that would tell us about kind of the origins of the seamount, and right. we probably have the highest likelihood of getting some of the the first rocks <laughs> of the seamount at the, towards the bottom. Um, and we're also interested in the the deep sea animal communities. Um, so we were only ever intending to go about from 2,500 to 2,100 meters. Um, so whereas the summit here is quite a bit shallower. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's a flat top guillot, and so we expected that means that the seamount at some point in its history has been above the surface of the ocean and had um, been eroded away, uh, which probably also means there's a lot of coral rubble up there. So that wouldn't be a, an ideal place for us to uh, accomplish the objectives of this expedition. Mm. Makes sense. Steven, are we allowed to see the uh, winch cam in one of our channels? Sure thing. The view in channel three of the back deck looks a little bit more calm. <laughs> so for our folks from home, as we're recovering, this is one of the views that our front row pilots are looking at to uh, see how the line is being recovered that is connected to Atalanta. We want to make sure that the wraps are coming in smooth, that they're not getting crisscrossed, um, that there's no issues. So it may not be a very glamorous view, but it's a very important view. <laughs> And in this view, on the drum on the right-hand side, that is uh, horizontal. If you look towards the top left of that drum is where you can see the wire, um, I think. I think that's where we are. All right, thanks, Stephen. Dealer's Choice, someone you want to show. Beth, I have a seamount question for you, if you have a second. OK. Um, so you're talking about the tops of the seamounts being flat versus pointy, if they've been exposed to, to air. In this region, do we see more seamounts that are flat on the top or pointed? Um, our major dive targets are the bigger seamounts. Um, and those generally are the ones that have been subaerial at some point, because there's just that much more uh, volcanic activity to make them so big. There are several conical seamounts in this area, but they're much smaller. Um, so we'll be doing a mixture of dives um, on both flat top geos as well as some of the smaller ones, if the weather cooperates and we can get in as many dives as we want. Great, thank you. Someone was wondering how far Hurt can go, and it's 4,000 meters, to my knowledge, the max for Hercules, or is it On this that? expedition, it'll be a little bit less. Um, uh, I believe the, the tether has been shortened a little bit, uh, and also we have to be really mindful of how much tension is on the cable. That's true. Um, so it's a mixture of things that determine how deep Hercules can go. Most of our dives will probably be focusing in the 1,500 to 2,500 meter range. Uh, so about 4,500 to 
7,500 um, feet. <coughs> Still pretty deep. Yep, more than a mile. Um, and that's generally an area where we find good densities of deep sea animals, um, but also good rocks. Some of the uh, some of the dives we aim to target some deeper depths to get at those deeper rock samples, even though the animal density may not be as high. Um, so we'll see. Annabelle, can you come over here? Hey pilots, front row, Ashton, Trevor. They're kind of like eye floaters. The stuff that floats across your eye when you're just the little, yeah, yeah.
Yeah, so uh, it is dinner time on the ship here in Hawaii, <laughs> or wherever we are in the ocean on Hawaii time. <laughs> so some of us are going to be popping in and out <laughs> for our dinner breaks. Uh, so thank you at our, our reliefs that are showing up, and we'll join you again shortly. Welcome Relief from earlier. Here about the back row, um, we have some of our earlier cast of characters. Anybody care to introduce themselves at this moment? You want to start? Hi, I'm Sid. Oh, she's Zane. asking if we want to introduce ourselves again. Hi everybody, I'm Christopher Klaus. I'm a science communication fellow from New Hampshire. Um, and in my other life, I teach middle school science. Mm -hmm. Nice. Hello, hi everyone. I'm Justin Umholtz. I work for Papahana Mokuakea Marine National Monument. I, I'm an educator as well and get to work with all kinds of ages and visitors at our Discovery Center in Hilo, Hawaii. Now I'm on the party line. Uh, <laughs> so I'm Val Finlayson. I'm uh, one of the lead scientists and I pretty sure I just pulled off something that I do almost every time on Zoom meetings where I was muted. So uh, I'm a postdoc uh, when I'm not on a ship, which is most of the time, uh, postdoc over at University of Maryland, and I work on uh, the geochemistry of uh, volcanoes a lot like this one that we just uh, uh, departed from. Great, thanks. And I'm Diane Hutt, your data logger here on the shift. And uh, Maybe you've just tuned in, but we are currently ascending. We are taking the ROVs off the bottom, bringing them back on deck, uh, hopefully with some great samples. So we've taken a number of samples, both for Val and for Beth, and um, a few other water samples as well. So we're excited to have those back on board in an hour and a half or so. <laughs> yep, we're pretty excited for that. Uh, we also picked up a... Uh, very intriguing sea star specimen that our uh, macrobiologists uh, are, are very interested in. So um, we're excited to get all of these samples into the lab and uh, see what stories they tell us. Indeed. So we'll, we'll start, uh, once uh, everybody's had a chance to eat dinner, um, we're gonna start getting things uh, set up in the lab and ready to take samples on board uh, by the time the ROV gets back. Yeah. And the crew with the ROV pilots and our back deck manager will be getting the deck ready with um, a lot of heavy machinery and gear to get those ROVs back on board. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, before we are able to rush out there and, and get our samples, then we have to get the go-ahead and make sure that everything is safe and secure. Yep. Yeah, so it looks like we're going to be moving, and a little bit of weather is moving this way, so we're going to... Uh, uh, try to avoid that and uh, go to some uh, dive sites next that um, 
are less likely to have a weather problem. Great. Yeah, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, even though it was a shorter dive today, um, I think a lot of us are happy with uh, what we've seen and what we've been able to uh, uh, do with our sampling. Yeah, I'd say that was a pretty successful mission. That might be a little preemptive before you get back on board, but um, <laughs> yeah, like in, in terms of how things went uh, from deck to, to the bottom and the actual sampling process was very smooth and mm -hmm. uh, saw a lot of things that we were hoping to see and sample. So yeah, very excited about it. Yeah, Chris Kelly did a lot of work uh, helping us plan out uh, dive routes and He's done just a phenomenal job with that, so he gets a lot of the credit for those. Yeah, shout out to our scientists ashore for sure for helping us uh, ID some items, being live with us to um, talk us through some of these dive sites. And um, yeah, it's it's great to have the audience on shore and the scientists on shore both to help us navigate this. Yep. We, um, Christopher was pointing out to me, we have a question from the audience about um, observing everyone gathering on the deck yesterday and wondering what that was about. And uh, we are in a place, we are guests in um, a place that has been part of Native Hawaiian genealogy for a thousand years plus. A uh, very important place and so uh, we have been following uh, certain protocols as we enter into this place um, led by a uh, cultural liaison assigned from our um, one of our trustees of the monument, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. So um, this is definitely a actually a World Heritage Site we're in, both for its cultural and natural resources. Uh, one of the only one in the United States for bo both. And um, as my colleagues will tell me, uh, from a Hawaiian worldview, the cultural and natural resources are not separate things. So as we enter in and and do take a few samples for to continue learning. It's important to follow the protocols of our of our hosts. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and uh, yeah. something I'm really psyched on is that um, we also have several uh, Hawaiian language speakers uh, on board who have been reaching out, uh, teaching all of us a little bit uh, more about this place, and also reaching out to our immersion and culturally founded foundation uh, schools on the Hawaiian Islands and um, making this experience come alive for for students at home. And hopefully we can be inviting more of them as they get older into into the roles we're playing. I really hope so. I think Ipo got to talk to her high school where she graduated from today. So that was really exciting. Mm -hmm. And of course, nobody plays one role here. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're also Ipo is data logger, is that right? Uh, I think it's science liaison, and then of course she does does some of the interactive with some of the classrooms and so yep. on. And Malanai, a teacher in her own right, is our one of the science communication fellows. But that's been a great and growing, uh, re improving relationship, I would say, and part of what Papahānau Mokuākea is all about is shared management and engagement. There's a lot. There's some really good blogs written about that, actually. Um, if you go to the expedition page for NA-138 and also NA-134, which was la just the previous fall. And for any teachers out That's there who fine. do teach in Olelo Hawaii, there, there are materials that are being developed as well. So um, you can check the Nautilus page, I believe, for, for links to the, that stuff. And there'll be more, more developing over the next couple of years. Thanks for sharing those links. Yeah. What I really like as somebody who's very beginning stages, stages of learning um, Hawaiian is that it's a, it's a living language and it's a growing language. Uh, I kind of hear how few people were speaking in the home uh, just a generation or two ago and if I'm remembering correctly, it was over 20,000 people speak Hawaiian in their homes now. So it's really just a testament to all of the 
the teachers and the uh, elders who have who have kept the language strong and kept it in their families and have now have gone through the incredibly hard work to establish schools and establish other learning programs to to ex to get to keep the language alive That's and incredible. thriving. With that in mind, over the course of this expedition leg, we're going to try to introduce some of the words, uh, the Hawaiian words for some of the um, the tools, equipment, and roles that we have here on the uh, on the ship. I was just looking for bide. Hmm. So Val would be a Kanaka Akea Kamai or Epikema, a scientist. Yep, very much so. Do we have Rhett here? I am. All right. Rhett is a an Akinia Pai Wikio, our video engineer or filmmaker, and both actually I should say. Where is our science communication fellow? Ah, uh, here we go. Can you read that okay? Uh, Kumu Ao Epikema is the science communication educator. Excellent. So while we're in blue water, uh, if you're wondering kind of where we are, um, so you've probably heard us mention that we're in the Liliukalani Seamounts. Um, if you look at a map, that is actually on the northern edge of the boundaries for Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. And uh, a vast portion of this protected place is deep open ocean water. So um, these explorations, the mapping, and then the exploration of the actual seamounts is really important for us to better understand uh, the life and the um, bathymetry and um, just generally uh, what is in these places that um, that we are we should be protecting and it really helps us make good management decisions uh, to ensure that this, that this amazing place thrives mm -hmm. yeah and in the uh, in the face of a changing planet changing climate this is becoming more important and more urgent than it ever has been so what so yeah, understanding that what we have down here is critical to helping uh, preserve it to the best of our abilities and protect it. Did we get any other good questions, Christopher? Uh, we did. Um, we had a question. If we caught something weird on the cam and took a screenshot, where could we send a picture for identification? Ooh. Wow. Um... That's a great question. Uh, I don't rightly know, but if we post it in the chat, is that possible? And um, we, we could certainly pass it to some of our scientists, either ashore or here on the boat, and uh, see if anybody can give it an ID. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. I think if you go, uh, our internet's a little slower than yours at home probably, but if you um, go to nautiluslive.org, and I bet you there is a contact email, that would probably be the easiest. I believe there is. Let's go um, take a look. I'm curious what you captured. Many of us are fairly new to the ship and the organization of the ship, and so we're going to track down an answer, but um, give oh, yeah. us a second. There's actually, if you go up to the, con if from the home page, you'll see the contact button right up at the top, and there are emails for um, probably education programs or it would be the one you'd want to use or general information. Yeah, and any other um, information along with that screenshot, like uh, uh, what time uh, during the dive, uh, that, that can be helpful too, because um, that will help us uh, locate that portion of the footage if we need to, uh, if we need to take another look. I 
I know I've also noticed uh, as I peek over at the questions coming in on Christopher's monitor that folks are enjoying kind of following along with the discoveries, um, trying to help us identify the different uh, things that we're seeing. And there are two guides that we refer to that has kind of an accumulated um, list of all the attacks of that that have been um, seen, not just in Papahanaumokuakea, uh, excuse me, Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, but also in, in other areas of the Pacific. So if you um, type in NOAA and Benthic ID, you should be brought to the Benthic Deepwater Animal Identification Guide ver version 3. And that has a lot of great resources. It's a little tricky because it's all scientific names, but you'll see all the images there as well. Um, there is also a newer one through the University of Hawaii that, uh, where they pulled the IDs for specifically uh, organisms in Papanomokoken, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So I'm gonna try to find that address for you as well. We also had a suggestion in the chat uh, that if you would like an identification, you could post your snapshot on Twitter and tag hashtag Nautilus Live and crowdsource that uh, among the other people who follow Nautilus Live on Twitter. Oh, yeah, that's a really good idea. On Twitter. So if you're just joining us, we are uh, in the process of rising up to the surface with our ROVs. Um, we had to cut our planned dive shorter than we would have liked due to some weather concerns and we're hoping to uh, dive again within the next day um, after I think we re relocate the ship to a better weather location. Yep. And I just found the other guide. Uh, so the University of Hawaii at Manoa uh, in their deep sea animal research center has a new guide that also has an inter interactive map you can use. So the easiest way to find that is just to type in D-A-R-C, and then ID guard, and that should bring you there. It's it's under uh, soest.hawaii.edu, but then there's a bunch more you would have to type if you're yeah, looking for it. And soest is spelled S-O-E-S-T, which is uh, an acronym for the uh, School of uh, Ocean and Environmental Sciences and Technology. Yeah. Actually, let me amend that in your search bar. Type in D-A-R-C space U-H for University of Hawaii, and then ID, and it'll come up. Just go to the Welcome to Dark SOAS Hawaii uh, headline hyperlink and follow along with us over the next couple weeks. Blue water is always good for sharing information. So um, I had mentioned earlier on our watch, but I'm an educator and I'm always looking for great resources to engage people with. And um, there is actually a really cool web page called the um, deepoceaneducation.org page. And that is a collaboration between um, the folks here with the Nautilus, uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute, and of course, NOAA on the uh, RV uh, Okeanos. And so all of this different deep ocean exploration has been pulled together into a really usable form for uh, for us as teachers um, to get to find lessons and really cool videos and you can um, search by topic or concept and then you can also um, get a free account and then curate everything you want to see so it's then really usable you can share with your students or share it with your your colleagues as you go so that's a great resource that just launched uh, within the last year I really want to take my hat off to all the people that made that possible. And um, then, of course, the uh, Nautilus Live website has some really great educational materials as well. And again, organized by, by theme or by subject. Um, so if you go to the NautilusLive.org website, you can click on the Education tab. There you will see an option to set up a ship to shore, kind of like a Zoom or a Google Meet with your uh, with your class and a couple of our folks here on board live. Um, there's also resources for the internships and other opportunities for folks to, to come learn with us. And then finally, there are the lessons and other resources, educational materials that are fun to kind of go through because there's quite a bit of inf information there.
If you're looking for some general information on the monument on Papahanaumokuakea, um, I would advise going to the nautiluslive.org page and looking at this expedition, and there you can see how to spell Papahanaumokuakea. Uh, and if you just put a .gov after that, it'll take you to the website of the organization I work for, uh, the Marine National Monument. And there are all kinds of um, resources available under the Education tab. So I'd encourage you to check that out. There's um, just an amazing number of reasons why this special place is protected. And uh, we, we are doing our best to share those stories and share that information to everyone. So for this monument, uh, what what exactly does Papahanaumokuakea mean? How does that translate? Oh well, it has a, it has a lot of layers of meaning that I don't I don't know if I'm the best person to explain at all. Um, but the, in a big picture, it's referring to two Hawaiian deities and the birthing of the islands, uh, and it's really um, symbolic of sort of connecting the fact that there is an entire archipelago that includes much more than what most of the world thinks of when we think of Hawaii. There's not just the, the young high islands that are populated currently, but uh, another 1,200 miles of uh, islands, and then as they age, turning into coral atolls. And eventually some of those submerge underwater. <laughs> and yeah. turn into seamounts. Yep. Oh, looks like I am going to, oh, unless you want to switch. Doesn't matter to me. We had some questions earlier in the evening about why we weren't sampling more corals. And um, it has to do with what our specific uh, top priority agenda is. We wanted to make sure that we uh, did those collections first. Um, and we were also being really judicious about what uh, living organisms we remove from the monument. Uh, we wanted to um, take only the things that are uh, absolutely uh, necessary uh, as decided by our science team. So we're focusing on a lot of rocks because we have uh, specific uh, tasks that our onboard geologists and biologists have asked us to work on. And uh, getting rock samples is a big part of their work. And we have both of those lead scientists on right now, <laughs> Val and Beth. Did you get a dinner relief, Diane? Okay. Ooh, it looks like we have a front row person who's up here for dinner relief. I'm wondering if your shift, Jess, has already started developing team names. Oh, sorry. What was that? Uh, just taking advantage of someone from a different watch being in with our watch for dinner to ask if you guys have already started coming up with team name ideas for Ooh. your watch. It's a secret. Get to oh, come on. <laughs> uh, no, we have it, but we definitely should so that we can, uh, you know, have 
Yeah, no, no. Team competition. No, I'm kidding. Yes, it's, all, yes. it's, all, it's all communal. No, we don't have a team name, though. But if we were going to have one, it might be like the rock stars or something. Because <laughs> geology. Because geology. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, pretty good. Was that a full wide for you, or was that me? That was me. OK, Raj. We had a geology question about why these very old metamorphic rocks are not buried under more sediment. Um, and Val, who was just on her way out, was explaining that uh, the sediment is also very old sediment. It takes a really long time to build up. Um, and so it's not going to, to bury the rocks on the seamount very quickly. Yeah, so where we are in the Pacific Ocean, we're underneath a gyre. Uh, which generally means there's not a lot of nutrients because we're far away from land. Um, so there's very relatively little life living in the surface ocean to then become sediment as it decays and sinks to the seafloor. So, um, and these seamounts are, are um, actually igneous in origin. They're not metamorphic. Um, so yeah, it just takes a while for them to get covered up. If we were to yeah, go down to the bases of the sea bounce, there would be thicker sediments. I, I misspoke there. They did identify them as igneous rocks. They okay. were talking about metamorphic rocks often forming under low, uh, under sediment. Yeah. Um, and there's another question about what is an atoll and how is it different from a sea mount? Yeah, so a sea mount is a feature that um, doesn't have any kind of surface Shalom. expression. Um, uh, it's not subaerial. It's not close enough to have a coral reef on top anymore. Um, and so an uh, uh, atoll feature is usually um, a coral reef that has been built up over a long, long period of time um, on top of a seamount. Um, so some of the seamounts that we're diving on have actually a flat top to indicate that they were once very close to the surface and were eroded away. Um, but they're, uh, they have, um, uh, as they've moved away from their hotspot where they were formed, uh, and the ocean plates are a little bit deeper, so these are no, uh, the coral reef buildup didn't keep up, so these yeah. are much deeper now. But if you were on an atoll and then dug Switching down, you would now. eventually find an underwater mountain. Oh, <laughs> no worries. You're welcome. Welcome back from dinner. Yeah, I'm, I just switched directions, so it might take a second to settle. I'm gone. See ya. Welcome back to my normal watch meets there. She'll be on the end. Hello. Oh, next to me, <laughs> Beth. Uh, we got our pilots coming back in, Ashton and Trevor, Navigator, uh, Lynette. And I think everyone's I think back. Steve's over there in the corner. He so, is yeah. over there. Hi, Steve. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're back on our regular watch post-dinner break. And what a delicious dinner it was. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Oh, you haven't gone yet? I get spelled out next. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> Got to get you some food, some grub. Yeah.
Uh, we had, someone's asking what we had for dinner. We had some, I think it was roasted chicken, quite good. Some potatoes, um, nice array of vegetables, some broccoli. What didn't we have? Yeah. I'm trying to think about everything. It's always so much goodness up there. The, I, the, the, the <laughs> cooks have been incredible on this cruise, really. Honestly, they are cranking out a lot of food, a delicious food, and Quite a great delicious. variety for us, um, including vegetarian and, mm -hmm. and vegan options as true. well for uh, folks on the ship. And um, we don't go hungry, um, but we are <laughs> working around the clock, and they are too. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a huge effort to be out here. It is. It definitely is. But... You yeah. didn't mention the uh, cupcakes with coconut on top. Oh my goodness, yep. Forget about the surprise desserts. You just wake up and there's <laughs> cookies and cake and all yeah. of the things yeah. sitting yeah. around. Which is probably like almost the best part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that the best part of today was yeah. everybody passing their COVID test so we could take oh. our masks off. Oh, that was lovely. Yes, yeah. I woke We've up from my nap and saw that email and just my whole heart just sang, Yay. honestly. <laughs> I know, I think a lot of us were nervous and mm -hmm. very careful <laughs> leading up to this trip. Yeah, uh, careful, we absolutely. We have to take COVID tests before, and then once we arrived to the ship, and then, yeah, after seven days. So, um, yeah, that yeah. was a nice feature. Now we have can a breathe little a little easier. Breathe a little easier. Um, oh, looks like someone asked about Where's Argus again? And I think, Beth, you said that there were some thruster issues, right, if I'm not mistaken, and that's why Atlanta kind of went in as a proxy today? Uh, yeah, so at the beginning of the expedition, <coughs> there were some uh, issues with Argus that were identified, and the decision was it would make more sense to switch out Atlanta for this expedition. Um, we still have Argus on board, um, but... Uh, that was the that was the call. Okay. Ooh, did we discover any new species of animals? I don't think so. So we did. We saw lots of um, coral species that um, have been observed in other parts of the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and other parts of the Pacific Ocean. So we have a pretty good idea of. Um, the species that we saw, um, maybe even down to the genus level, mm -hmm. um, and which is why we did not take samples of them. Um, uh, but we did see a sea star that has unknown taxonomic placement, and so we decided to collect that. Um, that's exciting. Yeah, so it's a, a specimen that's been observed on other dives in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands mm -hmm. on future uh, past expeditions. Um, but there's still not quite a lot known about that group, so that was the decision for collecting that animal. Fantastic. Um, oftentimes it's hard for us to know during an expedition whether we're finding a new species because that takes rigorous taxonomic work yes. by scientists um, uh, and curators at museums where many of these specimens go. Um, so we have good animal guides with us out here to help us understand what we're collecting um, and experts advising us from shore as well. Yeah. Guess we never really know until the lab work is done. Yeah. Not a question, but someone just wanted to say thank you for everything that we all do, and they're really excited that we're out here, and they can't wait to introduce Nautilus to their kids. Oh, so. great. <laughs> I'm always so impressed <laughs> of how many people are joining us from I all over know. the world, even when we're just in the blue water uh, transit up and mm -hmm. down. We're not even looking at the seafloor. Yeah. So thanks to our audience. Um, it's great to be exploring the ocean with you. If you, um, for anybody that's new to Nautilus, um, if you're on the Nautilus Live webpage, I'd encourage you to um, visit the links for this expedition, uh, Expedition NA-138, Luaea Ahiki'i Kekumu, 
um, to learn more about what we're doing out here, but also to learn more about all the team members we have out here. Um, we've got a great mix of crew and scientists, um, and it's a great way to learn about different careers. Nautilus um, Ocean Exploration Trust and Nautilus uh, offer many internships also um, for both science communication and you know ROV and video. So there's a lot of opportunities if you know people in your life that might be inspired. Um, check out, you can find all those opportunities on the Nautilus Live webpage. I think the new round of applications for next year is coming up in the summer, so okay. keep your eyes peeled, everybody. We're trying to get out here. Um, as a reminder to our audience, um, if you are just joining us recently and wondering what we're doing on this expedition. We are exploring underwater ancient volcanoes um, of an area of the seafloor called the Lilio Kalani Ridge, which intersects with the Papahanamoa Kuakea Marine National Monument, um, which is the largest marine protected area um, in the US and one of the largest in the world, and a really special place um, that is protected for both uh, cultural and natural uh, reasons. And if you would like to learn more about Papahanamoa Kuakea, um, please go visit the Papahanamoa Kuakea website, um, where you can learn a lot about the monument, um, what we know about it, a lot about the really special islands uh, and uh, bird life and sea life. Um, but we're we're part of um, a group who's really helping to explore the deep water environments of the Papahanamoa Kuakea, which is actually the largest part of this monument. So thank you for, for joining us and as we explore. And I believe that this is actually the 50th year of the National Marine Sanctuaries. I think so. Um, so there's also some special content on the website about that, um, about the sanctuaries uh, and monuments um, all over the United States. Ipo, do you want to tell the people a little bit about the history of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands a little bit and how that connects back to Hawaiian heritage and Hawaiian people? <laughs> oh, you have to also press that one. Perfect. Um, so um, for Native Hawaiian people, this is a place or realm of our gods or our akua. Um, so People only traveled up here for special reasons, whether it was ceremony or to seek some type of knowledge. Um, yeah. Yes. A lot of our, there's some Olelo or stories that, um, that come from these islands and kind of just talk about our origins and what we used to use this place for. Yes. Yeah, and if, um, Actually, we can maybe pull this up on the web page. Dun, 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 dun. Give me one second. Um. Someone wondering how expeditions, how long expeditions usually last. I think the average is about three weeks, but I think Nautilus can go up to 40 plus days, I believe. But we'll be on this expedition for about three weeks. Um, they can be shorter or longer, but I think this is around the sort of average length of time um, of expeditions. 
Great question. Thanks for that. Thank you. So for folks watching at home, if you have the quad view on or if you want to look at channel three, we're showing a map here of the Papahanaumoa Kuakea Marine National Monument, which is on the papahanaumoakuakea.gov website, um, just to help orient you to where we are um, and connect back to what uh, Ho'oipo was t talking with us about, the connection with um, Native Hawaiian culture. So you can see on this map, um, that uh, in white are the um, English names for some of the islands that make up the Northwest Hawaiian Island chain. But in yellow, you can also see names um, that are in Olelo Hawaii, uh, the Hawaiian language, um, uh, many of which have been recovered from reviewing uh, um, old written materials uh, uh, that talk about the connection uh, to these places. And so this is part of what the monument is doing also, is promoting these names and their connection um, to uh, Native Hawaiian culture. And you can see also in this map how long this uh, the Northwest Hawaiian Island chain is in comparison to both the distance of the main Hawaiian Islands. And also if you were to superimpose that on the um, the 48 states of uh, the contiguous United States, you would see that it actually stretches from basically California to Texas. Um, Ooh, I didn't know and that. so awesome. it's a really, yeah, so we traveled uh, about, I believe, 900 miles yes. <laughs> to get where we are from Oahu. Um, so it, it's quite a, quite a long ways. Yeah, um, we are out here. Looking at this map, um, we are working basically just north of the islands labeled as uh, Kamole or Lesan Island. So we just did a dive on King George Seamount, which you can't see here. Um, and we're recovering. And then we're going to head a little bit to the northwest, basically right underneath where the word uh, atoll is under Pearl and Hermes Atoll. So we'll be traveling another good little distance to get to our next site, um, trying to get out of this weather system that is right on top of us mm -hmm. for the next few days. No, uh, we're going we're here, we're going there. Yeah, so we'll be right, at, right up towards the border of the monument for our next dive, we think, if the weather holds out. Um, while I'm on this website, uh, I just wanted to show you some of the other really great resources that you can find here about uh, both educational materials um, and uh, for those of you uh, in Hawaii, um, about the Moku Papapa uh, Discovery Center, um, which uh, hopes to be open again soon to welcome visitors to really uh, offer you an opportunity to connect. But there's some really great information here about um, the really u unique ecosystems, coral reef e ecosystems, um, uh, and endemic bird populations that live within the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Some of which we get to enjoy uh, from the ship. So we've had lots of uh, Laysan albatross. Uh, some flying and fish we saw. What's that? Flying fish. Oh, lots of flying fish. Uh, some mahi-mahi uh, have been visiting. Um, several different types of um, uh, boobies, um, mass boobies, black footed boobies. What are the Hawaiian names for those? Oops. 
The Hawaiian name for boobies is an ah. That's it. And then for our lay sand albatross, we call those moli. Moli. And then we've been seeing some black-footed albatross, and we call those ka'upu. And the flying fish you also said the other day, right? Oh, yeah. Those are called malolo. I think that's my favorite name. <laughs> yeah. It just one. rolls off the tongue. Malolo. <laughs> I like that. Um, ROV, we're all, we transferred all of the, the still cam picks, so no need to leave the vehicles on for a transfer of any of that. Cool. Thanks. Yep. And thanks, Stephen. I think we're done showing the website, so you can put it up whatever you like. Roger that. We are currently just a little shallower of 1,400 meters on our way up. We hope to be on deck. Oh, I don't have a clock in front of me. Um, a little over an hour. I'm not sure of what kind of sunset we're going to get tonight with the, the cloudy weather. If any. A little cloudy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We got some pretty good ones before we got started, though, on the dives, I feel like. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so here we have in channel three uh, on the Nautilus live feed, you can see kind of the dreary drizzliness <laughs> <laughs> that is outside. And a few birds. Oh, yeah, we got a couple a a couple friends on the mast um, chilling out. There were several flying around the back of the ship earlier looking for their meal. Someone's wondering how much piloting is required during recovery and during descent. Yeah, so there's generally two watches um, that are working during um, a recovery or um, launch. Uh, so there are many hands on the back deck helping to safely get both ROV Hercules and ROV Atalanta um, launched. But in the van, uh, we would have at least one pilot um, who is, once Herc is in the water, is driving ahead or, or lateraling uh, along with the movement of the ship so that it can go from the um, port side where it's launched around to the um, after the ship and be in alignment with ROV Adelana. Um, we'll also have someone managing uh, by hand the um, control for the tether payout, um, the cable that is holding <laughs> the ROVs on the ship, right. um, which you're seeing a view of in channel three, uh, as we're spooling this cable in. Uh, so there'll be someone on, on back deck, and then once we're safely in the water and things look good, we pass all our checks and they transfer that control into the van also. Um, and so one of the ROV team is controlling the descent. Then we may also have one of the ROV team in during the dive to um, be monitoring the navigation. And then that tr control also gets transferred once everything is underway and the bridge is really happy with how things are working out. So many hands. Is there any type of mechanism where it's like a autopilot or anything since it's just kind of going straight up and straight down or do they have to sort of keep their hand on the controls, even if it's just sort of like going straight up. I would hope it's just like, go up. <laughs> you you want to answer that, Trevor? <clears throat> They're asking about like auto XY and stuff. Is there a way for you to, um, do you constantly have to be, have your hands on the controls or is there a way to uh, lock it in or have it be autopilot of any kind? Yeah, we generally just keep the hands on the controls all the time. Uh, there is an autopilot kind of thing, but it doesn't work as well as flying manually. So it's great for cer certain 
niche activities, but generally we just drive it around. We also set a, what's called a uh, Z bias, as the Americans call it. Z mm -hmm. bias, as I call it. It's the uh, default vertical thrust down to keep us in one spot. So if I take my hands off the stick, then the vehicle does not float up on its own. Awesome. Thanks for that. You leave it <coughs> locked in, thrusting up on the way up, though, right? What's that? Do you leave the thrusters like locked in on the way up once you've gotten into a good position? Oh yeah, hundred percent up. Yeah, all the way. Figured. That's our limiting factor on recovery speed: is how fast hurt can come up. Which is somewhat limited by how many rocks we put inside. Possibly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Dan also has. Or at least I'm sure everyone has this, but like if the arm is positioned just so we can reach the max velocity <laughs> upward. Oh, oh, hydrodynamics. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Epo, somebody tuned in yesterday and saw us all on deck. I think maybe they were watching us doing the oldie, and they were wondering what that was and why we were doing it. <laughs> um, so we were doing some type of protocol. Um, in Hawaiian culture, we believe in reciprocity, um, and that was just another way for us to give back to this place before we took from it. Um, and everybody participated, which is nice. And yeah, Beth gave Vi or fresh water and so did Val. Uh, yeah, but that was it. Just protocol, asking for per permission to do all these things that we were doing. Part of our work here in the monument, <coughs> uh, so we have a permit to be here. Um, it's a, as a marine protected area, it's not just anybody can roll up and, and do whatever they want here. You need to have permission. And one of the co-trustees of the monument is the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, um, which includes uh, the Papahanaumoa Kuakea Marine National Monument Native Hawaiian Cultural Working Group. And so as part of our permit um, uh, uh, and the relationship between Ocean Exploration Trust um, and the co-trustees of the monument, uh, we are following the guidance of how to incorporate and, and recognize and honor protocol, uh, cultural protocol, as we're doing our work here. So we're very thankful to have Ho'oipo and others with us um, Fast mode. to center that work. Um, <coughs> so throughout the expedition, you may see have you, have uh, different other ways that we try to observe protocol um, in relationship I've to the seen two other interactions systems that, that have, have either with, a turbo or um, boost button. The uh, this so funny. This environment. It's like slow, and medium, fast, boost. <laughs> what? Exactly, yeah. And again, um, if you were tuning in just a few minutes ago, if you're on the Papahanaumoa Kuakea Marine National Monument website, um, there's information there about the co-trustees and about uh, connecting to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and the work of the Cultural Working Group. And also on the Nautilus Live webpage and the expedition yep. page, um, you can also link to that material. Um, learn about uh, the um, names we have for the expedition and how they connect together and tell a story about the work that Ocean Exploration Trust is doing here in partnership with the monument. Um, uh, and the origin of those names and information about the cultural working group as well. <laughs> Looks like a parent is with their two young girls and they're wondering how they can become ocean explorers. So I think the first thing is that anybody can really do it. A lot of us have very different backgrounds and we all ended up on the same ship so anybody want to share how they got here 
Um, I, I can start, I guess. Um, although, Shelby, you have a great story, too. Um, so I am currently a, a marine scientist. I work at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences in Maine. Um, and I did not envision myself as a marine scientist when I was young, um, but I had a really great uh, chance to do an internship when I was um, starting out in college, and it changed my life. And I decided to try to study this field um, and was very fortunate to have the opportunity to do so. Um, and I know that many people on board this ship um, also kind of got into these jobs through internships. Um, and uh, just a quick shout out for the many internship opportunities that are available through um, Ocean Exploration Trust, which you can find out about on nautiluslive.org um, under the education part of the menu. Um, uh, but there's also many other uh, educational materials that there as well that will um, tell you about all kinds of careers. There's actually like a career uh, test mm -hmm. that you can do, um, things you like, and it tries to align you with different um, uh, types of careers because there's so many different types of um, jobs that happen out here on these ships. I've not done that career test. I wonder what I'd be. I know. Neither have I. <laughs> Maybe we can do that yeah. during another blue water time. I know. Totally, yeah. That would be fun. We'll ask the questions to each other. Um, let's see if I can find it. How about you, Shelby? How did you get into this? Uh, very randomly, um, at least for Nautilus. And um, it started with a friend literally sending me a link to the whale fall that um, EV Nautilus and OET found a few years ago. Mm. Um, I did not study deep sea anything while I was in school. I studied coastal policy and coastal ecology. And so somehow I found myself out here. And so um, kind of been thrusted into the ocean exploration space over the last couple of years and just think it's a really just important field and very exciting at that. Um, I think it's going to do wonders for how we look at our oceans and sort of catch us up in the whole sort of ocean race and space race, right? I mean, I mean, I might be biased, but I think the ocean's a little cooler, you know. It's also a little easier to get it's to. It's also a little easier to get to, you know. So, um, yeah, really have been enjoying it and found out about this science communication fellowship and um, kind of just jumped on it. Um, I like adventure, and so decided to challenge myself and come out here, and it's been very, very, very rewarding so far. So enjoyed it. Stephen, do you mind uh, bringing back up this uh, computer on channel three? Coming up. All right. So for folks joining from home on channel three, we're showing you a view of the Nautilus Live webpage. So if you went to nautiluslive.org and you were to click on the education tab, uh, you would come to this page. And if you'd like to learn more about all kinds of careers that could bring you out into the oceans, um, there's a, a career pathways part of the web page. And in that section, right in the middle, is the Corps of Exploration Career Quiz. Um, and so it's a little online quiz that you can do. And it'll also tell you about all kinds of different jobs. Um, everything from the captain to the crew that helped feed us to the engineering crew to our um, uh, video and documentarians <laughs> to the scientists and everything in between. Um, so that's a great way to learn about different activities, uh, different careers, and, and see what may be right for you. There's also all kinds of other great activities um, on the education part of the web page. Thanks, Stephen. No problem. I always like to point out that uh, science and engineering fields are probably the best thing to study if you're interested in coming on to Nautilus, but I studied filmmaking and ended up as an intern. And I know we've had artists on board in different fields, and there's no one path to get on Nautilus. Exactly. It takes everybody to help it run.
And while we're talking about um, educational opportunities with Nautilus, just a reminder to our audience that one of the things we do while we're out here is live ship to shore interactions, um, where um, if you're looking in channel three, you can see us in the van, but just behind us is the, um, uh, the control room for those ship to shore interactions. Um, so you can sign up um, if you're part of a school group or a club. Um, or any other kind of group that would be interested in connecting with us out here and a chance to talk with us live um, while we're while we're out here. Um, so if you go to the Nautilus Live webpage, is, yeah. again to that education tab, um, there's a section there for signing up for the live ship to shore interactions. Um, and something we are doing on this expedition and as part of this expedition series is also um, wanting to offer those ship to shore interactions in Lilo, Hawaii for audiences um, uh, and I believe we're also doing some ship shore interactions potentially um, in American Sign Language as well. Yep. Um, one of That's our true. science communication fellows um, uh, has the ability for that communication yep. tool and uh, so if that's of interest also please uh, let us know and um, sign up for those opportunities. Yep. Oh, and just to add, these are free. You do not have to pay for these at all. Um, you really just need a Wi-Fi connection and a screen and a microphone, and you know we can connect pretty much anyone, anywhere. So That's correct. Yep. Diane, we didn't hear about your path into oceans. How did you get on this ship? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, that's a, a convoluted path indeed. <laughs> um, I uh, did not study in ocean sciences at all. In fact, I um, got an ecology degree um, studying um, some of the southern Appalachian um, ecosystems. And I also studied art. And uh, at some point in time, I was teaching after college, after finishing college and a master's, I was teaching and um, needed a career change and uh, had a couple friends who had gotten on ships, worked in oceanography down in the Antarctic. And I thought, yeah, sure, I want to do that. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess I convinced people that I could go to sea. That was the first <laughs> time I had been to sea. Uh, and it's been 12 years now. so. Uh, I guess it stuck, and uh, I've been learning a lot this whole time. Um, I, I do sort of a science manager position, um, and so that means I, I work with a lot of different scientists, and I um, work on a lot of different instrumentation as well, so I don't have a particular research focus out here um, or in the work that I have done in, in the past, so it's more of a generalist uh, view, and um, yeah. Applied to Nautilus about a year ago in the science manager and training position and um, got delayed a little bit with COVID and I'm super glad to be here. I'm so excited about this. I loved today. Today was incredible. Like going down to the seafloor and being like, oh, I want to go and take that rock over there. It was just incredible. Um, to be able to see and identify one particular rock that you want to go, uh, rather than disturbing a lot of the seafloor. Mm -hmm. um, it was just really neat to see. So, spectacular. I'm glad to be here. And I'm excited to know that you studied art. I'm going to have to ask you about that later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I may, a short shout out actually um, to uh, connecting to art. Um, I've been collaborating with an artist in Maine who's oh, been nice. creating paintings inspired by some of these deep sea expeditions. And nice. they have a show up at Cove Street Arts um, right now. Uh, the opening reception is this Thursday, April 14th. Ooh. Um, uh, so if you're in the Portland, Maine area, uh, please go see some art inspired by the deep sea that's fantastic um that's fantastic i want to go yeah do I we have a that chance. map of the um destinations for the multi-viewer still pip h21 give me oh sorry spl i didn't mean to be on spl there okay <laughs> i was wondering who that was <coughs> um 
Yeah, I got a chance to see some of the paintings right before I left uh, as they were getting loaded in. Really inspiring. Fantastic. I think I'm going to have to Google that show, kind of look that up. Do you remember any of the names of the artists? Oh, yeah. Um, okay. So it's at Cove Street Arts. Hmm. The artist's name is Michael Droge. Uh, so you can also find the artist's uh, artist has their own web page, mm -hmm. michaeldroge.com. I can send it to you also afterward. I think that's just a neat overlap, you know, of, of uh, various fields and various ways of knowing about the world. Like you can explore the world through science, you can explore the world through art, yep. you can explore the world in various ways. And um, I think that's just fascinating to me. Yeah, I've been learning a lot through this collaboration in terms of how to communicate about the deep sea and make uh, help others make an emotional connection to a place that only uh, very few humans have a chance to connect with uh, yep. in a physical way. Um, but it is such a large part of our Earth, <laughs> the deep sea. Um, and so art, yeah, really has a, a powerful way um, to make that connection and importantly, uh, videos and live exploration like this have actually been a really important tool in that collaboration to um, help the artists I work with to understand the deep sea and what it looks like and all the fascinating animals down here uh, and earth processes. Yeah. So we're very thankful to Ocean Exploration Trust and others who make their live feeds available um, so that others can connect with what we're doing. Yeah, on that note, I got to do my first live interaction uh, with a classroom of students right. this morning with Shelby. And you rocked it. Oh, it was fun. <laughs> it was really great talking with the kids. They were they were very entertaining, had some good questions, some really good questions. I thought, man, I got to be on my toes for this. <laughs> um, it was really fun. I, I enjoyed it. Do you want to look at that? Yeah, so um, we have a question about how we can see where Hercules is at in the water. There's a couple ways for us to see that. Um, if you are on the Nautilus Live webpage, uh, on the homepage, usually off to the side, is a, a listing of the stats for ROV Hercules. And it'll take a little, just a moment for it to load for us here. Um, but it'll show us the depth of both Hercules and Argus and the water temperature. Um, and some information about the ship's heading. For us on the ship, we can also look at um, the tab called Grafana. So if you are at um, this page, it'll have all kinds of uh, extra information about the ship's heading and all those things, um, seeing it back over the last uh, little bit of time. But even folks at home can see some of this information um, on the live data, and you can even click on the More Data button to see some of this additional information. So we are currently uh, a little deeper than a thousand meters, one kilometer water depth and on our way up. I guess hopefully touching the surface around seven-ish. I Maybe think that's what we're aiming for, um, depending on our ascent rate. Yeah, so if you're on that Nautilus Live webpage and you uh, see that little um, sidebar on the right with the live data, if you were to click on the More Data button, you come to Grafana, and there you can see all kinds of information that we're collecting from the vehicles, including our depth, the water temperature, the oxygen concentration in the water, 
um, as well as the salinity of the water. Um, and actually, as we're moving through these shallower depths, you might want to keep an eye on the oxygen concentration because it's going to be going down before we get to the surface. We're going to be going through an area called the oxygen minimum zone. This is an area below the surface of the ocean as organic material sinks down. There's a lot of organisms that are eating that organic material and they're respiring a lot of oxygen um, during that process. And so that pulls the oxygen concentration down. Um, and then as we pass through that zone, then the oxygen concentration will come back as we approach the sunlit ocean waters where we have photosynthetic organisms that create oxygen. Nope. I didn't realize you had that up. Thanks, Stephen. Um, for those of you that were tuned in earlier while we were um, on the seafloor and wondering what some of those deep sea corals and sponges were that we were seeing, um, there's some really great resources online that you can learn about these organisms. So if you were to go to oceanexplorer.noaa.gov, um, there's a section in there that has an animal guide. Um, and so a lot of the imagery that we have on the back row here to help us understand all the animals we're looking at. We actually got from these oh. animal identification guides. So anybody can see these same images. We just have a curated set out here because there's so many. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you're curious more to learn more about the corals um, in the phyla cnidaria um, or any of the other animals, um, that's a great resource to check out. Speaking of identifying things, um, someone was just wondering in general what types of animals you usually see at the depths that we just were at. Yeah, so one of the, well, all the seamounts we're going to be diving on in this expedition have never been seen uh, with an ROV before and uh, explored in this way. Um, and so we don't have a great understanding of what we're going to see, but we can predict based on dives on other seamounts that have happened in the monument in other locations that we will see uh, alternating uh, types of corals and sponges. So uh, coming from the phyla, cnidaria, and porophora. Um, and on uh, Expedition 134, uh, um, um, the expedition we did in November, um, every seamount we dove on seemed a little different. Even different ridges of the same seamount had mm. different animals. So sometimes we saw a ton of different types of polyopagon sponges. Mm. Other times we would see different types of sponges, um, different types of coral, um, sometimes in incredibly high densities, sometimes in, in lower densities. Um, so we're not quite sure what we're going to see on these dives, but that's that's our general working hypothesis, that we're going to see deep sea corals, deep sea sponges, as well as all the um, uh, partner animals. Um, so one of the great things about corals and sponges is that they create structure, 3D structure on the seafloor, that other animals can take advantage of. That's true. Um, so they might uh, climb up into the corals so that they can also filter feed uh, away from the seafloor where the currents are a little bit stronger and the food delivery is a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, so oftentimes as we look at these corals, we'll see all kinds of things like brittle stars um, uh, and other associated taxa. Is it also something where you guys are able to predict more uh, even if we haven't been there, but based on the conditions, we know it's cold, we know it's deep, we know there's a lot of pressure, we know there's not a lot of light, and so at least have an idea of maybe what the corals and sponges will look like. Like, I feel like a lot of them are usually kind of light in color or opaque, I feel like, and a lot of animals um, are maybe all, like they're not super rich in color. I feel like a lot of them are 
That might just be where we were today. Mm -hmm. So actually, they can be quite colorful. Mm -hmm. um, bright pinks, bright reds, purples, yellows, mm -hmm. um, blues even. We, there's some nice. dives that have seen like cobalt blue uh, corals. Um, find that a lot of that color is lost when we recover them and preserve them. Uh, the um, the color that we see on the seafloor isn't a feature that gets retained mm. for various reasons. But yeah, you can actually see quite a lot of color, um, awesome. which is interesting, right? Because again, yeah. it's the deep sea. What, what do you need to be colorful for? I know, for? exactly. So, um, so it's, it's not necessarily a trait that is related to um, visual cues, mm -hmm. but maybe an indication of kind of the chemistry of the tissue mm -hmm. um, of the organisms. That's Yeah, and actually, um, one of the blog posts or the photo galleries mm -hmm. that was put together for the Luaea Hiki Kapapaku Expedition 9134, which you can find linked on the Nautilus Live webpage, um, actually has a nice like color guide to some oh, of the things nice. we saw on the seafloor um, that was put together by one of the science communication fellows on that expedition. So if you'd like to see some of that color, yes. you can check that out. I definitely will. Um, for our audience at home that's wondering what's going to happen after this dive. Um, so you may have noticed that um, we recovered this dive a little earlier than we had planned on. Um, and also, um, and that, that's partially driven by the fact that we have a weather system that's picking up around us. Um, and so we anticipate we're going to need to transit away from this site a little bit um, to get into some more favorable weather conditions. So we're not quite exactly sure when we'll be diving again next or where, um, but we'll keep you updated on the Nautilus Live webpage um, as we figure that out. Um, but we'll always be broadcasting the feed from the ship. Yep. You can see us out on the deck, see the weather that we're experiencing, maybe see some of the wildlife that we're seeing, um, but we're not quite sure when we'll be back in the water. Yeah, it's so true of science. You know, you set forth this plan and, you know, you plot oh, yes. all of the places that you'd like to see in the order you'd like to see them. And then, you know, sometimes weather and other conditions, you know, yep. crop up that you've got to manage and deal with and um, sort of amend your plan. Um, run from weather at times <laughs> and find a favorable condition to sample and then come back around if you can and... and hit some of the spots that you maybe couldn't have in the beginning. So yeah, you got to be flexible out here and um, just be able to, to roll with it a bit, mm -hmm. as they say. Yep. Always at the mercy of nature, no matter how, how much you want it to go exactly the way you want it to go. Coming back to what do we expect to see on the seafloor, um, we don't often see a high density of fish, but we often do, um, pretty much on every dive, see some type of either bony fish or eel fishes. Um, so that's another thing we'll be keeping an eye out for. Um, yeah, I think on the dive earlier, uh, it wasn't on our shift. It was one on one of the other ones, maybe mid-afternoon, they saw a Coryphenoides. Oh. This little, little guy that I've got pulled up here, but Okay. Yeah. Kind of has these long spike-like tendrils underneath. And look at my little guide here to see mm -hmm. what that looks like. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, those ones. Did it have the big eyes like these? Yeah. Nice. Um, good size, too. Uh, I'm just adjusting to like how to size things on these cameras, yeah. but if I ha had to guess, maybe 30 centimeters okay. long. Mm -hmm. oh, so interesting. Maybe Whoa. a tad, tad longer. 
I was trying to find it in the uh, in the log, and um, again, not super familiar on how to find everything, but um, yeah. Wow, yeah, the eyes are intense. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now it, it's like it's got this we like got stealth red light on. Yep. <laughs> on our last expedition um, in the Papahanaumoa Kuakea Marine National Monument last year, we would often get a guest appearance from a white tip ocean shark uh, as we were recovering the ROV. Oh. I haven't seen any yet on this expedition, um, but just because we're in the blue water doesn't mean we won't see anything, <laughs> um, especially as we get towards the surface um, where we might start to see some squid. Um, oh, there's a little fish. Oh, yeah, there's some, little, <laughs> some last, little guy. Last night there was a Mahi, maybe? Oh, yeah, we had Mahi yeah. circling the ship last night as we were getting ready to launch. Yeah, and we have some above the water species also. Ipo, you mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit about. Uh, oh, you did. Okay, I must have missed that, but apparently we talked about some of the albatross and uh, the other birds that we've been seeing as well. Oh, a really nice message from someone on the island of Oahu saying thank you for all of the work you are doing around the Papahana Mukulkea Marine National Monument and sharing it with all of us. May you all have safe winds along your journey. Mahalo. Nui loa. Oh. Mahalo. And has a lot of Mahalo. message. Great little yeah, emojis. Yeah, all the ocean emojis. <laughs> all the ocean emojis. I love it. <laughs> yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, it's really it. a, an honor to be able to help bring the deep sea of Papahanaumoa Kuakea to the world. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So for anybody on the Nautilus Live webpage, um, we're now at 900 meters, and if you're looking at the Grafana data, we've dropped in oxygen concentration about five micromoles. So we're again, we're heading up into that oxygen minimum zone. It's also getting a little bit warmer. It's still pretty cold. Four degrees C.
Someone's asking if we've gone on expeditions to Hawaii before, and absolutely. <laughs> um, a lot of last season was also in this area, um, mapping more specifically, I think. But yeah, absolutely, last year and the expedition right before this, NA-137 also was um, in this area. Yeah, so the last expedition was around the Kingman Reef uh, and Palmyra Atoll, which is a little bit further south of Hawaii. Um, but yeah, you're right, Shelby, that they're the Ocean Exploration Trust and Nautilus have uh, been in this region for a little while. Um, so our work in the Papahanaumokuakea Moakua Marine National Monument um, with Ocean Exploration Trust started with um, Expedition 133, Lua Ea Hiki'i um, Ke Lipo Lipo, I believe, is the name of the expedition. And that was the first one to come out to this area of the Liliokalani Ridge to do some multi-beam bathymetry mapping um, to get high-resolution imagery of the uh, high-resolution maps of the seafloor here to help us with this uh, planning our dives for this mm. expedition. Absolutely. So they were out for a few weeks uh, transiting around this part to collect the maps that we're now using. Then uh, we had uh, Expedition 9134 in November, Luaea Ahiki Kapapoku, which was a ROV expedition to explore seamounts within the Voyager seamount region that is just south of, um, on the southern side of the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Um, those were several seamounts that had been mapped previously, but also some that had not been mapped. And mm. so we, we mapped some more of those, but also the first time diving with an ROV to those locations. Then there was an expedition that was closer to the ho main Hawaiian Islands. Oh, okay. um, that visit It was outside of the monument um, around the Chautauqua seamounts. Um, so closer to the, the Hawaiian Islands, not quite in the monument, but in the same region. Um, and then, yeah, now we're out here. Um, and some of the work in the monument began with Ocean Exploration Trust uh, ba back on uh, Nautilus Expedition 101. So that oh, was an expedition, back. I believe in 2018, mm. that visited um, the musician seamounts. Uh, I think I'm getting that right. Um, uh, that are kind of in the, the northeastern end of the Papahanaumokuakea Kea Marine National Monument near uh, uh, Nihoa. Um, uh, on the eastern side of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, yeah, actually, it's uh, probably closer to Moku Mana. Um, mm. uh, yeah, and there are a number of expeditions coming up that are also yep. around Hawaii that you can um, look at the Nautilus Live webpage under the Expeditions tab to see what's coming up. Um, some engineering-based expeditions, testing out a bunch of new tools yep. for exploring the seafloor. Um, yeah. That's all it's going. And then I have had the, I have been um, lucky enough to also do expeditions um, on other vessels with the remotely operated ve vehicle Jason. Oh. That dove on uh, what used to be called Loihi Seamount, it's recently been suggested to have a new name or uh, go back to a traditional name, mm -hmm. um, uh, which I am forgetting at the moment. I apologize. <laughs> um, I think Kamaehu Kanaloa is the, the new name, but that uh, that is an active underwater volcano. Um, uh, hydrothermal vent system Ooh. that is just to the southeast of the big island of Hawaii. Um, maybe if volcanism <laughs> stays active, uh, you know, maybe it'll be the next Northwest Hawaiian Island. Who knows? Maybe. Uh, or not Northwest Hawaiian Island, but uh, island with, uh, in Hawaii. Um, it's a really unique hydrothermal system mm -hmm. compared to other hydrothermal vent systems in that um, the the waters that come out of the seafloor there, the hydrothermal fluids that come out of the seafloor are really enriched in iron, mm. but they don't have a lot of sulfur, which most which hydrothermal vent exactly. systems have a lot of sulfur. Yep, um, you hear about that a lot. So the, when you go down on dives there, the rocks look really rusty because there's a lot of iron, iron. oxidation happening. 
um, and some really unique microorganisms that live there um, that use that iron for energy and they precipitate these beautiful twisted stalks of iron oxides. Um, they look kind of like ribbons. Looks like someone's trying to remember whatever site you pulled up where we got these from. They said they missed it. Oh yeah. But they I'd be happy would like to bring to, that back up. Yeah. yeah, Stephen, do you mind showing my computer again if you uh, have a moment? So if anybody is interested in learning more about the animals that we might see, um, in channel three we're showing you this web page. It's oceanexplorer.noaa.gov. Um NOAA is spelled N-O-A-A for the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And on their webpage, um, so Ocean Explorer is part of NOAA, uh, and part of Ocean Explorer is uh, operating the exploration vessel um, Okeanos Explorer. And so under the Okeanos tab, there's an animal guide um, where you can learn all about um, the different types of animals um, that we might see in the deep sea. Um, organized by their taxonomic name. <laughs> so you might have to just poke around to see some names you recognize since not everybody is fully up to date on all the taxonomic classifications. Um, but for instance, corals would be under the Nidaria um, with a silent C at the beginning of that word. That's true. Um, some of the sponges we're, we're looking at would be under, and there's a lot of corals <laughs> in that guide. Um, the sponges that we're seeing would be at the very bottom under Porophora. That's the phyla that the sponges are in. Um, but there's a, a whole lot of links in here um, with um, pictures that you can check out. Um, there's also, um, that's probably the first place to go. There's, a, there's other resources available as well. So there's a group at the University of Hawaii called the Dark Lab, D-A-R-C. Um, and they have done a lot of the characterization of the videos. Uh, they do annotation of deep sea videos. And so they also have some uh, guides to some of the animals from this area. Um, because the Ocean Explorer page is really about all kinds of deep sea stuff, um, not just from Hawaii and the Papahanaumokuakea. Um, so that's another place you can check out. Yes, and DARK stands for deep is this Deep Sea Animal Research Center? Yes, that is it. The Deep Sea nice. Animal Research Center, or DARK, uh, with a C. Um, that's uh, out of the school of, um, oh, what does SOST stand for? School of Ocean Engineering, Science and Technology, Technology yeah, at so. University of Hawaii. Um, so that's another one that you can check out. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Oh, they have a cool logo. Yeah, maybe I can find that page too. Give me one second. Soast. Why? There it is. Yay. So for those watching on channel three, I'm pulling up the Dark Lab web page right now. So you can go there and they also right up at the top left have an animal guide. Um, and so we're, some of that imagery <laughs> um, is what we're using while we're out here. We have some cheat sheets here in the back row <laughs> that uh, help us with quick identification. And we're very thankful to all the scientists that have helped put this information together. Yeah, definitely. Helps a lot. Thanks, Stephen. No worries. And actually, one of the scientists that is part of the Deep Sea Animal Research Center is going to be giving a webinar for the National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, I believe it's coming up. It's either this Thursday or next Thursday. I'm not exactly sure. I will try to find out. Um, but Dr. Jeff Drazen, who studies a lot of the deep sea fishes, uh, deep sea fisheries in the Pacific Ocean, um, will be giving a talk about some of these really cool animals that we see in the deep sea and what we know about where they live and how they, how they interact um, and also how they might be threatened um, by changes happening in the deep sea. Uh, you can find that at the National Marine Sanctuaries webpage for their, um, I think it's called, oh, what is it called? What is their webinar series called? 
if Andy Collins is listening, he's going to be upset at me that I don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> um, We've had quite the day. I, th I, th yeah. <laughs> I think being able to Thursdays by the something, but I can't remember the th what the something is. I'm trying to see if I can find it in this. Um, I, I gave a webinar for that series last month. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so Jeff is going to talk April 21st, 12 p.m. Hawaii time. Um, on the connections between deep sea mining, the monuments, and fisheries. Um, so if you're interested in these animals, definitely check out um, that page. And you can find that at sanctuaries.noaa.gov yep. um, under their uh, education section. Thank you, Chef. You're welcome. <laughs> and for anybody following along with the Grafana data um, that you can find on the Nautilus Live webpage, uh, you will see that we're now at 600. 70 meters and we've passed through that oxygen minimum zone and now the oxygen concentrations are ramping right back up to we're at 54 micromoles per liter now um, so not everywhere in the deep sea is the same there's a lot of different environmental conditions that drive where where life lives and oxygen is a big one yep absolutely you'll see that the temperature is also increasing um, as we're coming up through this thermocline So one of the interesting things about being so far out into the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, but we have chosen to stay on Hawaii Standard Time on the ship, <laughs> even though we're a thousand miles away, um, which means we get uh, sunsets and sunrises at slightly different times than yeah. most other folks. So our sunrises are a little bit later in the day. Sunrises also, our sunsets. Um, but what I, they've been closer to eight or so. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. so even though we'll be recovering around 7 p.m. Hawaii time um, within the next half hour or so, um, it'll still be light outside. Yeah, we've had some nice sunsets too on our transit over. We got to enjoy some of those up from the higher decks. Yeah. Yeah, so the, it may be light outside, but yeah, uh, Shelby's pointing out that it looks like it's raining, <laughs> so it'll be a wet recovery. So in channel three on Nautilus Live, you can see the view from the camera over the monkey deck looking out towards the bow. And uh, yeah, looks like there's some raindrops going by. Which might be good for cleaning off some of the bird deposits that have <laughs> showed up on the monkey deck. <laughs> yeah. The vehicles have to get a fresh water wash anyway. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Give some help there too. I'm curious, we're actually seeing a few more things in the water column right now. Now that we're coming near the surface. Yeah, so the whole time we've been seeing these little little speckles going by, marine snow. Um, and then, yeah, some other salps and things. Um, we get into this fun zone with all kinds of 
all kind of gelatinous things. organisms, <laughs> um, which are actually some of the least well understood organisms in the ocean because they're so difficult to collect. Um, there's been some really great advances in the last few years in coming up with new sampling tools to try to collect some of these gelatinous organisms or to image them in 3D in situ um, because they disintegrate into goo uh, as you try to recover them. Um, so really cool, really cool work that was demonstrated um, last year uh, with Schmidt Ocean Institute testing out some of these new devices. Um, really cool stuff. Is it common to see, not see, but would there, would it be common to have uh, different types of larvae in this part of the water column from different animals? Yeah, there's probably all kinds of life stages uh, in this part of the water. Um, larval organisms, smaller zooplankton, um, marine detritus. Um, Everything. Yeah, microbes, <laughs> lots of microbes. Uh, all those microbes. Shelby, what, uh, from the Science Communication Fellow view, what mm -hmm. were the highlights of this dive? I think I snapped a lot of pictures of some of those somewhat dense coral communities. We were seeing off some of the steeper okay. ends of the ridge. Um, I don't know, I thought it looked really cool. Um, and then I'm assuming whoever was on the watch with the sea star had to have captured that. Yeah. Because <laughs> that was awesome. Um, but yeah, I thought those were really cool looking so make sure to snap those and then I think I may have snapped a couple of um, just more of our conversations about you know how we got here and okay things like that um, we don't always take highlights of video things uh, especially in these blue water moments mm -hmm. um, it becomes really helpful to have some of the audio when we talk about some of the more inspiring parts of how we got here oh, yeah that um, makes sense so I try to get a little bit of everything So I guess that could be a, a message to our audience that if you send us some inspiring questions and spark a good conversation, you might, be might flag highlight. that as something we highlight. <laughs> Somebody is really dedicated. They say they uh, plan their sleep schedule around the dives. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> wow, that's <laughs> great. Was, yeah. I love it. I was wondering if we had any idea when the next one will probably launch. Um, I wish I could give you a really solid answer to that question, but unfortunately with the weather picking up, um, we are still deciding what our plan of action is gonna be um, and how far we're gonna need to transit to get into another favorable weather window. Um, to get in the water again. So it it's probably gonna be at least 24 hours from now, maybe longer, yeah. depending on how far we have to go. Um, some of our next sites are hundreds of miles away because <laughs> um, we're trying to cover a pretty large area of the seafloor. So uh, unfortunately, I can't give you any more detail than that at this stage, um, other than to say it's probably gonna be at least a day. Yeah. 
I admire the dedication, though. So. Yeah. Planning sleep schedules around it. Yeah. And as soon as we have those plans up, um, we'll post those uh, notices to the Nautilus Live webpage so that people can plan accordingly. Hi, front row. <laughs> Hello, back row. Can definitely do that. All right. Ipo. Hi. Do you, <laughs> <laughs> do you, I was wondering, do you, um, like sail a lot when you're at home or on boats or this is kind of your first time <laughs> being out here. Yeah, tell us a little bit of your story. Um, I grew up sailing only in the daytime. I never spent more than a day um, out on the water. So this is my the farthest I've been on a boat in general. And the longest probably. And the longest. <laughs> so wow. yeah, this is, I'm, yeah, first time. This is on you to me. Fantastic. Oh. Oh. My God, I got a hood on my jacket. <laughs> we're getting reports that we're getting a lot of rain on deck right now. <laughs> it's quite wet, and that's going to be the way the recovery is going to go. Yeah, it's very wet out there. As always, our deck chief was already on top of it. I knew. <laughs> Ooh, that makes it cold in here. <laughs> And I like the one thing I forgot to pack was my rain jacket. Mm. <laughs> you know, I've done so many expeditions and I always forget one thing. I do every time. I don't know how this happens. There's some extras in the lab. So for um, those of you who are just tuning in, we are uh, bringing the vehicles back out of the water. So we have already collected all the samples that we um, were able to during the time span that we had for this dive and with weather. Mm -hmm. We had to sort of cut things short a little bit, but yeah, we are just bringing um, Hercules and Atalanta back up to the surface, gonna give them a fresh water rinse and get them ready for the next dive. Yeah, so we'll, we're at a, about 450 meters, uh, so in just a few minutes we'll be really switching over to recovery mode. Um, and you can see there on channel 3 on Nautilus Live's feed the view of the back deck and the folks getting ready um, for the vehicle recoveries. So getting the straps ready, another equipment ready. Shelby, do you know how soon after a dive um, the video recordings are posted to YouTube? Of just like the raw dive footage? As in highlights or just in general? Just in general, like where you can see segments of the dive. I'm not mm. sure. Yeah, okay. Steve's like, <laughs> I'm not sure. I know certain highlights are posted pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so we usually rank highlights three, four, or five. Five being like, this is amazing, post this right now. And the team ashore sort of gets right on that. Yeah. Um, so those are usually sometimes posted. Uh, sometimes within the same sort of watch period. But okay. yeah, we can, we can definitely try to find that out though. Yeah, I'm gonna quickly go to the Nautilus Live YouTube channel. Let's see. Um, do, 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 do.
Uh, someone commented on the videos and says you can watch the raw video on YouTube for the prior 12 hours, but other than that, you have to wait for highlights? Okay, yeah, that's what I was thinking about, trying to figure out where that was. So that might be under the, the live streams on the YouTube channel. I knew there was a way to go back in time, I just didn't know yeah. how far. I think the full dives are eventually posted to yeah. YouTube. Nice. Yeah, so if you're on the Nautilus Live YouTube channel, there's also um, different curated playlists, and one of them is the Nautilus Live dive recordings. Um, so it looks like they have a lot of them going up to some recent expeditions. Oh, this is an interesting question. Um, so someone's wondering about the fresh water rinse that the vehicles get when they get back up and wondering if we have like a desalination system on board or is just fresh water that we bring from the mainland? Oh yeah, um, <laughs> great question. Uh, so first of all, everything on deck is going to get a fresh water rinse from the rain. Mm -hmm. um, and then we do, um, we do make our own fresh water on the ship. Um, that is one of the key functions <laughs> that mm -hmm. the ship's crew needs to be on top of. Um, and we all have to be mindful of out here that we're not wasting water um, because we can only make so much per day. Um, yeah. Good to know. You gotta know your real dedicated deep sea team that's just like, I don't care if it's raining, I'm just gonna keep standing on the deck in the rain. <laughs> Wait until they hit the top. <laughs> gotta yep. be out here when they get here. Yep. Yeah. That's the truth. Can't work at sea and be afraid of getting a little wet. That's true. <laughs> oh, look at that, Mark's dancing. I saw that, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Got a Maybe we can get him to do one of the TikTok videos. Good luck. I was about to say that might be might be a little challenging, but can you tell us a little bit more about the what what we are trying to do with TikTok on this expedition? Not all of our viewers probably watch. Yeah, I'm even new to TikTok myself, but um, I think a lot of the reason we use social media in general is really just to engage people, right? Mm -hmm. It's where so many people get their information these days. Um, so, of course, we have, like, blogs and all the resources on um, NautilusLive.org. Um, but TikTok, I think, makes people feel involved, and I think it connects people to um, the actual humans that are out here doing things. You know, we're working, but, mm -hmm. you know, we're also a, you know, small little small little family out here and so I think it helps people sort of connect to us and you know see that you know we're working but you know we're also finding ways to uh, have fun and loosen up and get through the long watches and everything like that so um, yeah I think it makes people feel engaged and feel connected yeah great mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. see that we have a question about our desalinization system, and I don't know the answer to that, and I am <laughs> looking on our web page, uh, nautiluslive.org slash tech. Um, but I'm not seeing it there either, so we'll have to look into that. Yeah. Um, ask Mark somebody knows. who knows. <laughs> Does Trevor know? I don't know. What's um, the question? It's related to how, what kind of desalinization oh, system what kind? we have. Is yeah. it RO? Mm -hmm. Is it something else? Um, but I don't know the answer to that, so we'll have to... Look that up. Stay right. tuned. We'll stand, try to stand by. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody's wondering what's the main use for the banana crane. The yellow one. Yes. Are we ready for that? Do it after. Pretty wet out there. Yeah. Um. So both of the the cranes. The <laughs> The white crane on the port side is primarily used for lifting ROV Hercules out of the water, in and out of the water. Um, the other crane can be used to supplement uh, other, 
either shoreside crane needs or deployment of other instrumentation. Um, generally doesn't get used as much when we don't have other instrumentation that needs to be launched. Um, for instance, like AUVs or um, other vehicles. Um, there's also other cranes on, on other decks of the ship that are for launching the rescue boat. Um, but the white one that you see in channel three is the, the primary crane that gets the most activity in concert with the A-frame. Hey right. everyone, I'm gonna jump up out of my chair and let uh, Rhett do the, take this recovery from the video chair. Great, Sounds and I am also nice gonna leave the back row so I can get ready for collecting my samples. Sounds good. It's go time. Yeah, <laughs> pleasure, <laughs> pleasure doing our first shift with y'all. Yes, absolutely, looking Thanks, forward Beth. to the many more. Someone asking about the food in the galley. What type of food? All kinds, really. Um, what the, type of food? I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Yeah, they're just asking what kind of food is served in the galley. Oh, and wow. And I was like, I don't know. We get a little bit of everything. We get. Yeah, they, they try and put out a quite a large variety every meal yep. so that there's, you know, a lot of different selections from, you know, soups to stir fries to salads. Um, They've been preparing both meat items and vegetarian and vegan items. Yep. Um, and then we do have uh, snacks also that are available at all hours. And so, yeah, uh, during these late midnight shifts, I expect <laughs> I'm going to be having some of those snacks too. So, yeah, they've, uh, they've been really doing a, a wonderful job in the galley feeding us. It's been delicious and... Um, also just like a great variety with vegetables, meats, things like that, so. Yep, and I also feel like we get a lot of different uh, cuisines from different cultures. Like we get like- Yeah, that's true. Spring they, rolls and mm -hmm. um, a lot of the crew is from Europe. So I think we get a lot of food that's a little reminiscent of that and so mm -hmm. yeah, really depends. Thanks for sharing the C C2 Pro Ocean Networks Canada footage. Um, that's a great, great link. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, someone asking, is there a sample camera? Uh, there is a camera that sort of hovers right over the bio box on Hercule Hercules. Um, if you have been watching for the last couple of hours, we collected um, a nice crusty rock and we also collected a sea star earlier. And so that box that um, the sea star was put in, I believe specifically was the bio box and there is a camera right over that so that um, we can get footage of when we collect samples and put those in the box. So yeah, sort of, there's a sample cam. Yeah, it is, from what I understand, also the way that the pilots um, know where the position and how to put the sample in. So they're, they're rotating, you know, the arm around Hercules. The box will slide out from its porch mm -hmm. just slightly on a hydraulic system. And then the top, as, a, as the porch slides out, the top kind of slides back and they can drop the sample into the the box. There's one on the forward porch, there's one on the starboard side, and then we also have Niskin bottles where we can take water samples. We have um, a, a carousel also of bottles that contain, that could contain biological samples also. We call it the slurp um, because it's a lot like a vacuum. 
Just so, <laughs> yep, slurp <laughs> right, up. right on up into these jars. And so right now, um, part of the data and science team are preparing um, trays and boxes and yep. various items to take the samples off of Hercules once it comes on deck, bring them into the lab quickly. Some of those will need to maintain temperature, so they'll yep. go quickly into freezers or refrigerators. Um, some of them can be dry, like some of the rock samples uh, don't have to be at temperature, but some of the biological samples will degrade quickly, so they'll go into those spaces. Yep. Um, and then we have a, ver a variety of processes that will um, be using these samples and then preserving them for uh, later use in the lab as well. So there are folks down there in the lab getting ready for that. Uh, Shelby and I are still up here in the back row uh, manning the science team stations. So, and our pilots and navigators are still, are still here with us as well. Roger that. Here's a question about the wet lab, Diane. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know. Um, they were wondering, will there ever be like audio available? I know there is a camera in the wet lab, so you can observe when they're processing. But I'm not sure if it, if I think maybe it has to be on if, if there's going to be audio um, for the public to be able to hear. But I'm not sure if that's always on. Yeah, there is that camera in the corner. And from what I understand, that is on at times, usually when we're processing samples. I don't know if it will be this time or not. It's a good, good question. Yeah, but I'll have to see. Mm -hmm. Might be possible. This is a good question. Uh, Trevor, not Trevor, sorry. Uh, Rhett and Steve, quick question. Um, once the vehicles are back on board and the scientists are starting to process, uh, is it possible to put one of the main feeds on the wet lab so that people can sort of see? Cool. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, we should be able to put that main view from the wet lab once all the processing starts. Yep, that's our normal procedure. Okay, yep. fantastic. Good to know. Everyone will get to see that sea star exactly. here. Exactly. Including me, because I'm excited. I know. I'm <laughs> excited for it. So our vehicles that are, are at depth at about 250 meters, we still got a little bit to go, but yeah. not too far. Not too long. Yeah, their deck team is still getting ready for all that process on back. Really takes a huge coordinated effort. It really does. To both launch and recover.
Just to give you all an update, we're still hauling back uh, on the two ROVs, Atalanta and Hercules. They're at about a depth of 185 meters currently and uh, should be on the surface of the water shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some excited and anxious folks to, to <laughs> get those back on board and the scientists would like their samples. and. Um, yeah, we're just getting ready for that process to happen. Yep. Do we know what the rate of ascent is? Um, you know. Ew. I don't know how fast. Usually like 30 meters a minute is typical sort of wire speed, but I was looking for it on our drop downs. Still getting used to the all of the measurements in the dashboard that we look at I here, know. Shelby, on our <laughs> on our first shift here <laughs> up in the control center. Someone's wondering if they serve ice cream in the galley. We haven't had any yet, or have we? But I think they do. Eventually. We have not had ice cream yet. And there's been some chatter among, I've, I've among heard yeah, the technicians who yeah. have been here for a number of years saying that typically Sundays are ice cream Sunday day. So yeah. we'll see if that rolls around next yeah. week and uh, if there any ice cream appears. I hope so. That'd be great. Right now, a little treat Love here. Love ice cream. Mm -hmm. How many people work on the ship? Well, um, there are 50 of us on here, which I think is the capacity. I think so, yeah. I think it's the capacity, yeah. So um, 50 people is the max uh, of crew. So including the sort of more permanent year-round crew that works on Nautilus, but also um, the guest scientists and communicators and interns, et cetera, that also uh, come on board to do the expeditions and do the science, but yeah. 50 folks. Here's an interesting question. Somebody says, other than a tiger, what would you be surprised to see down on the ridge? <laughs> <laughs> well, tiger would definitely be And that would definitely be something, surprising. Something, um. <laughs> you know, uh, some of our scientists ashore have given us sort of a list of items that they um, 
mm. would love to see and don't often get to get to sample and so that they have sort of what we've called the wish list in a way mm -hmm. um, of sort of extraordinary finds so corals that you may not see very often certain fishes things like that so there are organisms that um, we hope to see um, that would be a bit of a surprise but um, are not on the current sample Yeah, okay, I think I found some of those, or at least Chris Kelly on shore, I yep, think, wish yep, list. <laughs> yep, his wish list. Yeah, so a sea spider would be something that we would be ecstatic to see. King crab. Um, something called a squat lobster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought we saw a one of oh, a certain species of squat lobster today. Maybe not exactly the one he was hoping for. So they are still readying the back deck, swinging the crane around, getting it ready to pick Hercules. They've got the starboard A-frame. Um, yep. Lights on, out, <laughs> uh, line handlers getting ready. Um, We're not, what, under 100 meters now? We are, about 90 meters. Yep. Looks like time to surface Any is saying now. about seven minutes. So, looks like wire speed is about 12 to 15 meters a minute, so a little slower than what I had originally quoted you.
Someone asked, do you ever take samples of trash to see what grows on it? Hmm. I don't know if that's, I'm pretty sure there are studies out there in general that probably look at marine debris, but don't know if that's ever been like a focus of a Nautilus expedition. Bridge main deck, radio check. Main deck bridge, loud and clear. We okay to recover? Yeah, the bridges go for recovery. Yeah, um, I do know of other studies going on looking at particular microbes that may live on plastics, uh, microplastics, or larger ocean plastics and things. I don't know if, I don't know that any of that is happening on Nautilus currently. That might be a question for Beth with her microbes. Does she ever look at, like, yeah. Actually, one of the reasons that we do that freshwater rinse of uh, the ROVs when we get them on board, and then specifically like all of the different um, sampling boxes, is so that we don't contaminate other sites, so that That's we don't true. bring, you know, something from site to site. Not necessarily debris, but um, maybe a parasite, an al alga, uh, something like that. You know, that would um, that we could move from place to place. So is it mostly the tether that's sort of winding the ROVs back up, or is it more the thrusters and the pilots have to kind of use the thrusters more to bring them back up, I wonder? It's that winch cable that's holding everything nav. back in. Not bridge. Yeah. Can you reduce thrust to 25%, please? Copy that. Yeah, here in the control room where we've got a, a big view watching that, that winch slowly spool. Mm -hmm. And so. Perfect. 
Eric, just so you know, you're coming up on the port side a little bit. It's not bad, though. We're at a depth of about Roger. 13 meters, so getting close to that that time. Yep. Any moment now. <gasps> yeah, Herc, you may want to run out to the end of the other. Roger. Yeah, we're going to hold here until you get out on the end of the tether. You've got a lot of slack. Yeah, I guess is, uh, Adelaide is coming up backwards, so you guys got to drive out there. Roger. Okay, we'll start coming up. Uh, Trevor, you're moving off to the uh, starboard side now. Roger. like we are recovering Atalanta. Yep. For those of you tuning in, if you look at uh, satellite feed two, you'll see a view of the aft deck and Atalanta is on her way up. And then Hercules will be right behind her. Bridge, nav. Nav bridge. Can you increase thrust to 90% and hold position? Increase the, uh, restore the, the power to the jet pump and then go into DP, hold position. Roger that. Thank you. Looking from the at the back deck cam right now, those of you at home, you can see Hercules back there on the surface behind the ship. Yeah. Chilling out, waiting to get on board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Drifting. Crews securing Atalanta. You can see that they're putting ratchet straps. All stations, the uh, ship is back in DP and full securing power stored to, the, to deck. the jet pump. Roger that. Thank you.
Tech Control. That's a mahi swimming by there. <laughs> Look at that. Mm -hmm. We're here on the surface, about to recover Hercules, and there's a mahi-mahi swimming by. We're going to move ahead. Roger. Okay, vehicles coming out of the water now. Roger. Wait. Hercules is coming up out of the water now. High voltage, secure.
Delta, a ship is back in DP, holding. Hercules coming aboard just over the rail right now. Kind of a tense moment. Copy. Mm -hmm. the seas and conditions that we have right now. You see a little bit of swing with Hercules mm -hmm. as they're trying to settle it onto deck. Yeah. Not an easy task. Trying to get into that right rectangular position mm -hmm. to get it back in there. Yeah. And Herc is on deck. I think they'll try and reposition it mm -hmm. just slightly. But we got them back. We got them both back safely. And with some samples. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! Okay, vehicles on deck, securing now. All right. Now. All right. Awesome. Copy that. Back. Congratulations, team. Stations, uh, Captain, going off radio comms. I guess this concludes our dive on King George Reef. <laughs> I believe that's true. <laughs> on to the next El Fini. <laughs> Fini, indeed. All right, well, thank you everybody for tuning in and you can continue to keep up with all of our dives on nautiluslive.org. We hope that you will continue to send in your questions, which have been really great, by the way. Um, we will be uh, taking the samples that we collected with Hercules and the scientists will be processing those and going through those in the wet lab. And then we will be heading, um, I think, north or northwest to try to get out of this storm before we do another dive. So we appreciate it, and we hope to see you on our next watch. Yeah, thank you, everyone at home. Thank we you so much, you. everyone. Till next time. <laughs>